Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Witch Week by Diana Wynne Jones, narrated by Gerard Doyle. This book begins with the following editor's note. Late one night in the year 1605, a soldier named Guy Fawkes was caught with some two tons of gunpowder that he'd smuggled into a cellar beneath the Houses of Parliament in London. Fawkes was arrested, tried, and executed for his part in the Gunpowder Plot, a failed conspiracy to blow up King James I and most of his government the very next day, November 5th. Centuries later, English people still set off fireworks, light bonfires, and burn guys in effigy to celebrate November 5th as Guy Fawkes Day. And now, Witch Week. Chapter One The note said, Someone in this class is a witch. It was written in capital letters, in ordinary blue ballpoint, and it had appeared between two of the geography books Mr. Crossley was marking. Anyone could have written it. Mr. Crossley rubbed his ginger moustache unhappily. He looked out over the bowed heads of Class 6B and wondered what to do about it. He decided not to take the note to the headmistress. It was possibly just a joke, and Miss Cadwallader had no sense of humour to speak of. The person to take it to was the deputy head, Mr Wentworth. But the difficulty there was that Mr Wentworth's son was a member of 6B. The small boy near the back, who looked younger than the rest, was Brian Wentworth. No. Mr Crossley decided to ask the writer of the note to own up. He would explain just what a serious accusation it was, and leave the rest to the person's conscience. Mr Crossley cleared his throat to speak. Some of 6B looked up hopefully, but Mr Crossley had changed his mind then. It was journal time, and journal time was only to be interrupted for a serious emergency. Larwood House was very strict about that rule. Larwood House was very strict about a lot of things, because it was a boarding school run by the government for witch orphans and children with other problems. The journals were to help the children with their problems. They were supposed to be strictly private. Every day, for half an hour, every pupil had to confide his or her private thoughts to their journals, and nothing else was done until everyone had. Mr Crossley admired the idea heartily. But the real reason that Mr Crossley changed his mind was the awful thought that the note might be true. Someone in 6B could easily be a witch, only Miss Cadwallader knew who exactly in 6B was a witch orphan, but Mr Crossley suspected that a lot of them were. Other classes had given Mr Crossley feelings of pride and pleasure in being a schoolmaster. 6B never did. Only two of them gave him any pride at all, Teresa Mullet and Simon Silverson. They were both model pupils. The rest of the girls tailed dismally off until you came to empty chatterers like Estelle Green or that dumpy girl Nan Pilgrim, who was definitely the odd one out. The boys were divided into groups. Some had the sense to follow Simon Silverson's example, but quite as many clustered around that bad boy Dan Smith, and others again admired that tall Indian boy Nirupam Singh or they were loners like Brian Wentworth and that unpleasant boy Charles Morgan. Here Mr Crossley looked at Charles Morgan, and Charles Morgan looked back with one of the blank, nasty looks he was famous for. Charles wore glasses, which enlarged the nasty look and trained it on Mr Crossley like a double laser beam. Mr Crossley looked away hastily and went back to worrying about the note. Everyone in 6B gave up hoping for anything interesting to happen and went back to their journals. 28th October 1981, Teresa Mullet wrote in round, angelic writing. Mr Crossley has found a note in our geography books. 
I thought it might be from Miss Hodge at first, because we all know Teddy is dying for love of her. But he looked so worried that I think it must be from some silly girl like Estelle Green. Nan Pilgrim couldn't get over the vaulting horse again today. She jumped and stuck halfway. It made us all laugh. Simon Silverson wrote, 28, 10, 81. I would like to know who put that note in the geography books. It fell out when I was collecting them, and I put it back in. If it was found lying about, we could all be blamed. This is strictly off the record, of course. I do not know, Nirupam Singh wrote musingly, how anyone manages to write much in their journals, since everyone knows Miss Cadwallader reads them all during the holidays. I do not write my secret thoughts. I will now describe the Indian rope trick which I saw in India before my father came to live in England. Two desks away from Nirupam, Dan Smith chewed his pen a great deal and finally wrote, Well, I mean, it's not much good if you've got to write your secret feelings. What I mean is it takes all the joy out of it and you don't know what to write. It means they aren't secret, if you see what I mean. I do not think, Estelle Green wrote, that I have any secret feelings today but I would like to know what is in the note from Miss Hodge that Teddy has just found. I thought she scorned him utterly. At the back of the room, Brian Wentworth wrote, sighing, Timetables just ran away with me. That is my problem. During geography, I planned a bus journey from London to Baghdad via Paris. Next lesson, I shall plan the same journey via Berlin. Nan Pilgrim, meanwhile, was scrawling, this is a message to the person who reads our journals. Are you Miss Cadwallader, or does Miss Cadwallader make Mr Wentworth do it? She stared at what she had written, rather taken aback at her own daring. This kind of thing happened to her sometimes. Still, she thought, there were hundreds of journals and hundreds of daily entries. The chances of Miss Cadwallader reading this one had to be very small particularly if she went on and made it really boring. I shall now be boring, she wrote. Teddy Crossley's real name is Harold, but he got called Teddy out of the hymn that goes, Gladly my cross I'd bear. But of course everyone sings, Crossley my glad I'd bear. Mr Crossley is glad eyed. He thinks everyone should be upright and honourable and interested in geography. I am sorry for him. But the one who was best at making his journal boring was Charles Morgan. His entry read, I got up. I felt hot at breakfast. I do not like porridge. Second lesson was woodwork, but not for long. I think we have games next. Looking at this, you might think Charles was either very stupid or very muddled, or both. Anyone in 6B would have told you that it had been a chilly morning and there had been cornflakes for breakfast. Second lesson had been P.E., during which Nan Pilgrim had so much amused Teresa Mullet by failing to jump the horse, and the lesson to come was music, not games. But Charles was not writing about the day's work. He really was writing about his secret feelings, but he was doing it in his own private code so that no one could know. He started every entry with, I got up. It meant, I hate this school. When he wrote, I do not like porridge, that was actually true, but porridge was his code word for Simon Silverson. Simon was porridge at breakfast, potatoes at lunch, and bread at tea. All the other people he hated had code words too. Dan Smith was cornflakes, cabbage, and butter. Teresa Mullet was milk. But when Charles wrote, I felt hot, he was not talking about school at all. He meant he was remembering the witch being burned. It was a thing that would keep coming into his head whenever he was not thinking of anything else, much as he tried to forget it. He had been so young that he had been in a stroller. His big sister, Bernadine, had been pushing him while his mother carried the shopping, 
and they had been crossing a road where there was a view down into the market square. There were crowds of people down there, and a sort of flickering. Bernadine had stopped the stroller in the middle of the street in order to stare. She and Charles had just time to glimpse the bonfire starting to burn, and they had seen that the witch was a large, fat man. Then their mother came rushing back and scolded Bernadine on across the road. You mustn't look at witches, she said. Only awful people do that. So Charles had only seen the witch for an instant. He never spoke about it, but he never forgot it. It always astonished him that Bernadine seemed to forget about it completely. What Charles was really saying in his journal was that the witch came into his head during breakfast, until Simon Silverson made him forget again by eating all that toast. When he wrote Woodwork Second Lesson, he meant that he had gone on to think about the second witch, which was a thing he did not think about so often. Woodwork was anything Charles liked. They only had woodwork once a week, and Charles had chosen that for his code on the very reasonable grounds that he was not likely to enjoy anything at Larwood House any oftener than that. Charles had liked the second witch. She had been quite young and rather pretty, in spite of her torn skirt and untidy hair. She had come scrambling across the wall at the end of the garden and stumbled down the rockery to the lawn, carrying her smart shoes in one hand. Charles had been nine years old then, and he was minding his little brother on the lawn. Luckily for the witch, his parents were out. Charles knew she was a witch. She was out of breath and obviously frightened. He could hear the yells and police whistles in the house behind. Besides, who else but a witch would run away from the police in the middle of the afternoon in a tight skirt? But he made quite sure. He said, why are you running away in our garden? The witch rather desperately hopped on one foot. She had a large blister on the other foot, and both her stockings were laddered. I'm a witch, she panted. Please help me, little boy. Why can't you magic yourself safe? Charles asked. Because I can't when I'm this frightened, gasped the witch. I tried, but it just went wrong. Please, little boy, sneak me out through your house and don't say a word, and I'll give you luck for the rest of your life. I promise. Charles looked at her in that intent way of his, which most people found blank and nasty. He saw she was speaking the truth. He saw, too, that she understood the look as very few people seemed to. Come in through the kitchen, he said and he led the witch, hobbling on her blister in her laddered stockings, through the kitchen and down the hall to the front door. Thanks, she said. You're a love. She smiled at him while she put her hair right in the hall mirror, and after she had done something to her skirt that may have been witchcraft to make it seem untorn again, she bent down and kissed Charles. If I get away, I'll bring you luck, she said. Then she put her smart shoes on again and went away down the front garden, trying hard not to limp. At the front gate, she waved and smiled at Charles. That was the end of the part Charles liked. That was why he wrote, but not for long, next. He never saw the witch again, or heard what had happened to her. He ordered his little brother never to say a word about her, and Graham obeyed, because he always did everything Charles said. And then he watched and waited for any sign of the witch or any sign of luck. None came. It was next to impossible for Charles to find out what might have happened to the witch, because there had been new laws since he glimpsed the first witch burning. There were no more public burnings. The bonfires were lit inside the walls of jails instead, and the radio would simply announce... Two witches were burned this morning inside Holloway Jail. Every time Charles heard this kind of announcement, he thought it was his witch. It gave him a blunt, hurtful feeling inside. He thought of the way she had kissed him, and he was fairly sure it made you wicked too to be kissed by a witch. He gave up expecting to be lucky. In fact, to judge from the amount of bad luck he had had, he thought the witch must have been caught almost straight away. 
for the blunt, hurtful feeling he had when the radio announced a burning made him refuse to do anything his parents told him to do. He just gave them his steady stare instead. And each time he stared, he knew they thought he was being nasty. They did not understand it the way the witch did. And since Graham imitated everything Charles did, Charles's parents very soon decided Charles was a problem child and leading Graham astray. They arranged for him to be sent to Larwood House, because it was quite near. When Charles wrote games, he meant bad luck. Like everyone else in 6B, he had seen Mr Crossley had found a note. He did not know what was in the note, but when he looked up and caught Mr Crossley's eye, he knew it meant bad luck coming. Mr Crossley still could not decide what to do about the note. If what it said was true, that meant inquisitors coming to the school, and that was a thoroughly frightening thought. Mr Crossley sighed and put the note in his pocket. Right, everyone, he said. Put away your journals and get into line for music. As soon as 6B had shuffled away to the school hall, Mr Crossley sped to the staff room, hoping to find someone he could consult about the note. He was lucky enough to find Miss Hodge there. As Theresa Mullet and Estelle Green had observed, Mr Crossley was in love with Miss Hodge. But of course he never let it show. Probably the one person in the school who did not seem to know was Miss Hodge herself. Miss Hodge was a small, neat person who wore neat grey skirts and blouses, and her hair was even neater and smoother than Theresa Mullet's. She was busy making neat stacks of books on the staff room table, and she went on making them all the time Mr Crossley was telling her excitedly about the note. She spared the note one glance. No, I can't tell who wrote it either, she said. But what shall I do about it? Mr Crossley pleaded. Even if it's true, it's such a spiteful thing to write. And suppose it is true. Suppose one of them is. He was in a pitiable state. He wanted so badly to attract Miss Hodge's attention, but he knew that words like which were not the kind of words one used in front of a lady. I don't like to say it in front of you. I was brought up to be sorry for witches, Miss Hodge remarked calmly. Oh, so was I. We all are, Mr Crossley said hastily. I just wondered how I should handle it. Miss Hodge lined up another stack of books. I think it's just a silly joke, she said. Ignore it. Aren't you supposed to be teaching 4C? Yes, yes, I suppose I am, Mr Crossley agreed miserably. And he was forced to hurry away without Miss Hodge's having looked at him once. Miss Hodge thoughtfully squared off another stack of books until she was sure Mr Crossley had gone. Then she smoothed her smooth hair and hurried away upstairs to find Mr Wentworth. Mr Wentworth, as deputy head, had a study where he wrestled with the schedules and various other problems Miss Cadwallader gave him. When Miss Hodge tapped on the door, he was wrestling with a particularly fierce one. There were seventy people in the school orchestra. Fifty of these were also in the school choir, and twenty of those fifty were in the school play. Thirty boys in the orchestra were in various football teams, and twenty of the girls played hockey for the school. At least a third played basketball as well. The volleyball team were all in the school play. Problem. How do you arrange rehearsals and practices without asking most people to be in three places at once? Mr Wentworth rubbed the thin patch at the back of his hair despairingly. Come in, he said. He saw the bright, smiling, anxious face of Miss Hodge, but his mind was not on her at all. So spiteful of someone, and so awful if it's true, he heard Miss Hodge saying. And then, merrily, but I think I have a scheme to discover who wrote the note. It must be someone in 6B. Can we put our heads together and work it out, Mr Wentworth? She put her own head on one side invitingly. Mr Wentworth had no idea what she was talking about. 
He scratched the place where his hair was going and stared at her. Whatever it was, it had all the marks of a scheme that ought to be squashed. People only write anonymous notes to make themselves feel important, he said experimentally. You mustn't take them seriously. But it's the perfect scheme, Miss Hodge protested. If I can explain... Not squashed yet, whatever it is, thought Mr Wentworth. No, just tell me the exact words of this note, he said. Miss Hodge instantly became crushed and shocked. But it's awful! Her voice fell to a dramatic whisper. It says someone in 6B is a witch! Mr Wentworth realised that his instinct had been right. What did I tell you? he said heartily. That's the sort of stuff you can only ignore, Miss Hodge. But someone in 6B has a very sick mind, Miss Hodge whispered. Mr Wentworth considered 6B, including his own son, Brian. They all have, he said. Either they'll grow out of it or we'll see them all riding around on broomsticks in the sixth grade. Miss Hodge started back. She was genuinely shocked at this coarse language, but she hastily made herself laugh. She could see it was a joke. Take no notice, said Mr Wentworth. Ignore it, Miss Hodge. And he went back to his problem with some relief. Miss Hodge went back to her stacks of books, not as crushed as Mr Wentworth supposed she was. Mr Wentworth had made a joke to her. He had never done that before. She must be getting somewhere. For, and this was a fact not known to Teresa Mullet or Estelle Green, Miss Hodge intended to marry Mr Wentworth. He was a widower. When Miss Cadwallader retired, Miss Hodge was sure Mr Wentworth would be head of Larwood House. This suited Miss Hodge, who had her old father to consider. For this, she was quite willing to put up with Mr Wentworth's bald patch and his tense and harrowed look. The only drawback was that putting up with Mr Wentworth also meant putting up with Brian. A little frown wrinkled Miss Hodge's smooth forehead at the thought of Brian Wentworth. Now there was a boy who quite deserved the way the rest of 6B were always onto him. Never mind, he could be sent away to another school. Meanwhile, in music, Mr Brubeck was asking Brian to sing on his own. 6B had trailed their way through Here We Sit Like Birds in the Wilderness. They had made it sound like a lament. I prefer a wilderness to this place, Estelle Green whispered to her friend Karen Grigg. Then they sang Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree. That sounded like a funeral dirge. What's a kookaburra? Karen whispered to Estelle. Another kind of bird, Estelle whispered back. Australian. No, no, no! shouted Mr Brubeck. Brian is the only one of you who doesn't sound like a cockerel with a sore throat. Mr Brubeck must have birds on the brain, Estelle giggled. And Simon Silverson, who believed strongly and sincerely that nobody was worthy of praise except himself, gave Brian a scathingly jeering look. But Mr Brubeck was far too addicted to music to take any notice of what the rest of 6B thought. The cuckoo is a pretty bird, he announced. I want Brian to sing this to you on his own. Estelle giggled, because it was birds again. Teresa giggled too, because anyone who stood out for any reason struck her as exceedingly funny. Brian stood up with the songbook in his hands. He was never embarrassed, but instead of singing, he read the words out in an incredulous voice. The cuckoo is a pretty bird. She singeth as she flies. She bringeth us good tidings. She telleth us no lies. Sir, why are all these songs about birds? He asked innocently. 
Charles thought that was a shrewd move of Brian's, after the way Simon Silverson had looked at him. But it did Brian no good. He was too unpopular. Most of the girls said, Brian, in shocked voices. Simon said it jeeringly. Quiet, shouted Mr. Brubeck. Brian, get on and sing. He struck notes on the piano. Brian stood with the book in his hands, obviously wondering what to do. It was clear that he would be in trouble with Mr. Brubeck if he did not sing, and that he would be hit afterward if he did. And while Brian hesitated, the witch in 6B took a hand. One of the long windows of the hall flew open with a clap and let in a stream of birds. Most of them were ordinary birds, sparrows, starlings, pigeons, blackbirds and thrushes, swooping around the hall in vast numbers and shedding feathers and droppings as they swooped. But among the beating wings were two curious furry creatures with large pouches which kept uttering violent laughing sounds, and the red and yellow thing swooping among a cloud of sparrows and shouting, Cuckoo! was clearly a parrot. Luckily, Mr. Brubeck thought it was simply the wind which had let the birds in. The rest of the lesson had to be spent in chasing the birds out again. By that time, the laughing birds with pouches had vanished. Evidently, the witch had decided they were a mistake. But everyone in 6B had clearly seen them. Simon said importantly, If this happens again, we all ought to get together and... At this, Nirupam Singh turned around, towering among the beating wings. Have you any proof that this is not perfectly natural? He said. Simon had not, so he said no more. By the end of the lesson, all the birds had been sent out of the window again, except the parrot. The parrot escaped to a high curtain rail where no one could reach it and sat there shouting, Cuckoo! Mr. Brubeck sent 6B away and called the caretaker to get rid of it. Charles trudged away with the rest, thinking that this must be the end of the games he had predicted in his journal. But he was quite wrong. It was only the beginning. And when the caretaker came grumbling along with his small white dog trailing at his heels to get rid of the parrot, the parrot had vanished. To two. The next day was the day Miss Hodge tried to find out who had written the note. It was also the worst day either Nan Pilgrim or Charles Morgan had ever spent at Larwood House. It did not begin too badly for Charles, but Nan was late for breakfast. She had broken her shoelace. She was told off by Mr. Towers for being late, and then by a monitor. By this time the only table with a place was one where all the others were boys. Nan slid into the place, horribly embarrassed. They had eaten all the toast already except one slice. Simon Silverson took that slice as Nan arrived. Bad luck, fatso. From further down the table, Nan saw Charles Morgan looking at her. It was meant to be a look of sympathy, but like all Charles's looks, it came out like a blank, double-barrelled glare. Nan pretended not to see it, and did her best to eat wet, pale, scrambled egg on its own. At lessons, she discovered that Teresa and her friends had started a new craze. That was a bad sign. They were always more than usually pleased with themselves at the start of a craze, even though this one had probably started so that they need not think of witches or birds. The craze was white knitting, white and clean and fluffy, which you kept wrapped in a towel so that it would stay clean. The classroom filled with mutters of two pearl, one plain, twist two, but the day really got into its evil stride in the middle of the morning, during P.E. Larwood House had that every day, like the journals. 
6B joined with 6C and 6D, and the boys went running in the field, while the girls went together to the gym. The climbing ropes were let down there. Teresa and Estelle and the rest gave glad cries and went shinning up the ropes with easy, swinging pulls. Nan tried to lurk out of sight against the wall bars. Her heart fell with a flop into her gym shoes. This was worse even than the vaulting horse. Nan simply could not climb ropes. She had been born without the proper muscles or something. And since it was that kind of day, Miss Phillips spotted Nan almost at once. Nan, you haven't had a turn yet. Teresa, Delia, Estelle, come on down and let Nan have her turn on the ropes. Teresa and the rest came down readily. They knew they were about to see some fun. Nan saw their faces and ground her teeth. This time, she vowed, she would do it. She would climb right up to the ceiling and wipe that grin off Teresa's face. Nevertheless, the distance to the ropes seemed several hundred shiny yards. Nan's legs in the floppy, divided skirts they wore for Jim had gone mauve and wide, and her arms felt like weak, pink puddings. When she reached the rope, the knot on the end of it seemed to hang rather higher than her head and she was supposed to stand on that knot somehow. She gripped the rope in her fat, weak hands and jumped. All that happened was that the knot hit her heavily in the chest and her feet dropped sharply to the floor again. A murmur of amusement began among Teresa and her friends. Nan could hardly believe it. This was ridiculous, worse than usual. She could not even get off the floor now. She took a new grip on the rope and jumped again. And again. And again. And she leaped and leaped, bounding like a floppy kangaroo, and still the knot kept hitting her in the chest, and her feet kept hitting the floor. The murmurs of the rest grew into giggles, and then to outright laughter until at last, when Nan was almost ready to give up, her feet somehow found the knot, groped, gripped, and hung on. And there she clung, upside down like a sloth, breathless and sweating, from arms which did not seem to work any more. This was terrible, and she still had to climb up the rope. She wondered whether to fall off on her back and die. Miss Phillips was beside her. Come on, Nan, stand up on the knot. Somehow, feeling it was superhuman of her, Nan managed to lever herself upright. She stood there, wobbling gently around in little circles, while Miss Phillips, her face level with Nan's trembling knees, kindly and patiently explained for the hundredth time exactly how to climb a rope. Nan clenched her teeth. She would do it. Everyone else did. It must be possible. She shut her eyes to shut out the other girls' grinning faces and did as Miss Phillips told her. She took a strong and careful grip on the rope above her head. Carefully, she put the rope between the top of one foot and the bottom of the other. She kept her eyes shut. Firmly, she pulled with her arms. Crisply, she pulled her feet up behind, gripped again, reached up again with fearful concentration. Yes, this was it. She was doing it at last. The secret must be to keep your eyes shut. She gripped and pulled. She could feel her body easily swinging upward toward the ceiling, just as the others did it. But around her, the giggles grew to laughter and the laughter grew into screams, then shouts, and became a perfect storm of hilarity. Puzzled, Nan opened her eyes. All around her, at knee level, she saw laughing red faces, tears running out of eyes, and people doubled over, yelling with mirth. Even Miss Phillips was biting her lip and snorting a little. 
and small wonder. Nan looked down to find her gym shoes still resting on the knot at the bottom of the rope. After all that climbing, she was still standing on the knot. Nan tried to laugh too. She was sure it had been very funny. But it was hard to be amused. Her only consolation was that after that, none of the other girls could climb the ropes either. They were too weak with laughing. The boys, meanwhile, were running around and around the field. They were stripped to little pale blue running shorts and splashing through the dew in big spiked shoes. It was against the rules to run in anything but spikes. They were divided into little groups of labouring legs. The quick group of legs in front with muscles belonged to Simon Silverson and his friends and to Brian Wentworth. Brian was a good runner in spite of his short legs. Brian was prudently trying to keep to the rear of Simon, but every so often the sheer joy of running overcame him and he went ahead. Then he would get bumped and jostled by Simon's friends, for everyone knew it was Simon's right to be in front. The group of legs behind these were paler and moved without enthusiasm. These belonged to Dan Smith and his friends. All of them could have run at least as fast as Simon Silverson, but they were saving themselves for better things. They loped along easily, chatting among themselves. Today they kept bursting into laughter. Behind these again laboured an assorted group of legs. Mauve legs, fat legs, bright white legs, legs with no muscles at all, and the great brown legs of Nirupam Singh, which seemed too heavy for the rest of Nirupam's skinny body to lift. Everyone in the group was too breathless to talk. Their faces wore assorted expressions of woe. The last pair of legs, far in the rear, belonged to Charles Morgan. There was nothing particularly wrong with Charles's legs, except that his feet were in ordinary school shoes and soaked through. He was always behind. He chose to be. This was one of the few times in the day when he could be alone to think. He had discovered that as long as he was thinking of something else, he could keep up his slow trot for hours and think. The only interruptions he had to fear were when the other groups came pounding past him and he was tangled up in their efforts for a few seconds, or when Mr Towers, encased in his nice warm tracksuit, came loping up alongside and called ill-advised encouragements to Charles. So Charles trotted slowly on, thinking. He gave himself over to hating Larwood House. He hated the field under his feet, the shivering autumn trees that dripped on him, the white goalposts and the neat line of pine trees in front of the spiked wall that kept everyone in. Then, when he swung around the corner and had a view of the school buildings, he hated them more. They were built of a purplish sort of brick. Charles thought it was the colour a person's face would go if he was choking. He thought of the long corridors inside, painted caterpillar green, the thick radiators which were never warm, the brown classrooms, the frosty white dormitories, and the smell of school food, and he was almost in an ecstasy of hate. Then he looked at the groups of legs straggling around the field ahead, and he hated all the people in the school most horribly of all. Upon that, he found he was remembering the witch being burned. It swept into his head unbidden, as it always did. Only today it seemed worse than usual. Charles found he was remembering things he had not noticed at the time. The exact shape of the flames, just leaping from small to large, and the way the fat man who was a witch had bent sideways away from them. He could see the man's exact face, the rather blobby nose with a wart on it, the sweat on it, and the flames shining off the man's eyes and the sweat. Above all, he could see the man's expression. It was astounded. 
The fat man had not believed he was going to die until the moment Charles saw him. He must have thought his witchcraft could save him. Now he knew it could not, and he was horrified. Charles was horrified too. He trotted along in a sort of trance of horror. But here was the smart red tracksuit of Mr. Towers loping along beside him. Charles, what are you doing running in walking shoes? The fat witch vanished. Charles should have been glad, but he was not. His thinking had been interrupted, and he was not private any more. I said, why aren't you wearing your spikes? Mr. Towers said. Charles slowed down a little while he wondered what to reply. Mr. Towers trotted springily beside him, waiting for an answer. Because he was not thinking any more, Charles found his legs aching and his chest sore. That annoyed him. He was even more annoyed about his spikes. He knew Dan Smith had hidden them. That was why that group was laughing. Charles could see their faces craning over their shoulders as they ran to see what he was telling Mr. Towers. That annoyed him even more. Charles did not usually have this kind of trouble the way Brian Wentworth did. His double-barrelled nasty look had kept him safe up to now, if lonely. But he foresaw he was going to have to think of something more than just looking in future. He felt very bitter. I couldn't find my spikes, sir. How hard did you look? Everywhere, Charles said bitterly. Why don't I say it was them? He wondered, and knew the answer. Life would not be worth living for the rest of the term. In my experience, said Mr. Towers, running and talking as easily as if he were sitting still, when a lazy boy like you says everywhere, it means nowhere. Report to me in the locker room after school and find those spikes. You stay there until you find them, right? Yes, said Charles. Bitterly, he watched Mr. Towers surge away from him and run up beside the next group to pester Nirupam Singh. He hunted for his spikes again during break, but it was hopeless. Dan had hidden them somewhere really cunning. At least after break, Dan Smith had something else to laugh about besides Charles. Nan Pilgrim soon found out what... As Nan came into the classroom for lessons, she was greeted by Nirupam. Hello, said Nirupam. Will you do your rope trick for me too? Nan gave him a glare that was mostly astonishment and pushed past him without replying. How did he know about the ropes, she thought. The girls just never talk to the boys. How did he know? But next moment, Simon Silverson came up to Nan, barely able to stop laughing. My dear Dulcinea, he said, what a charming name you have. Were you called after the Archwitch? After that, he doubled up with laughter, and so did most of the people nearby. Her name really is Dulcinea, you know, Nirupam said to Charles. This was true. Nan's face felt to her like a balloon on fire. Nothing else, she was sure, could be so large and so hot. Dulcinea Wilkes had been the most famous witch of all time. No one was supposed to know Nan's name was Dulcinea. She could not think how it had leaked out. She tried to stalk loftily away to her desk, but she was caught by person after person, all laughingly calling out, Hey, Dulcinea! She did not manage to sit down until Mr. Wentworth was already in the room. 6B usually paid attention during Mr. Wentworth's lessons. He was known to be absolutely merciless. Besides, he had a knack of being interesting, which made his lessons seem shorter than other teachers'. But today, no one could keep their mind on Mr. Wentworth. Nan was trying not to cry. When, a year ago, Nan's aunts had brought her to Larwood House, even softer, plumper and more timid than she was now, Miss Cadwallader had promised that no one should know her name was Dulcinea.
Miss Cadwallader had promised. So how had someone found out? The rest of 6B kept breaking into laughter and excited whispers. Could Nan Pilgrim be a witch? Fancy anyone being called Dulcinea. It was as bad as being called Guy Fawkes. Halfway through the lesson, Teresa Mullet was so overcome by the thought of Nan's name that she was forced to bury her face in her knitting to laugh. Mr Wentworth promptly took the knitting away. He dumped the clean white bundle on the desk in front of him and inspected it dubiously. What is it about this that seems so funny? He unrolled the towel, at which Teresa gave a faint yell of dismay and held up a very small fluffy thing with holes in it. Just what is this? Everyone laughed. It's a booty, Teresa said angrily. Who for? retorted Mr Wentworth. Everyone laughed again. But the laughter was short and guilty, because everyone knew Teresa was not to be laughed at. Mr Wentworth seemed unaware that he had performed a miracle and made everyone laugh at Teresa instead of the other way around. He cut the laughter even shorter by telling Dan Smith to come out to the blackboard and show him two triangles that were alike. The lesson went on. Teresa kept muttering, It's not funny. It's just not funny. Every time she said it, her friends nodded sympathetically, while the rest of the class kept looking at Nan and bursting into muffled laughter. At the end of the lesson, Mr Wentworth uttered a few unpleasant remarks about mass punishments if people behaved like this again. Then, as he turned to leave, he said, And by the way, if Charles Morgan, Nan Pilgrim and Nirupam Singh haven't already looked at the main notice board, they should do so at once. They will find they are down for lunch on high table. Both Nan and Charles knew then that this was not just a bad day. It was the worst day ever. Miss Cadwallader sat at high table with any important visitors to the school. It was her custom to choose three pupils from the school every day to sit there with her. This was so that everyone should learn proper table manners, and so that Miss Cadwallader should get to know her pupils. It was rightly considered a terrible ordeal. Neither Nan nor Charles had ever been chosen before. Scarcely able to believe it, they went to check with the notice board. Sure enough, it read, Charles Morgan, 6B, Dulcinea Pilgrim, 6B, Nirupam Singh, 6B. Nan stared at it. So that was how everyone knew her name. Miss Cadwallader had forgotten. She had forgotten who Nan was and everything she had promised. And when she came to stick a pin in the register or whatever she did to choose people for high table, she had simply written down the names that came under her pin. Nirupam was also looking at the notice too. He had been chosen before but he was no less gloomy than Charles or Nan. You have to comb your hair and get your blazer clean, he said, and it really is true you have to eat with the same kind of knife or fork that Miss Cadwallader does. You have to watch and see what she uses all the time. Nan stood there, letting other people looking at the notices push her about. She was terrified. She suddenly knew she was going to behave very badly on high table. She was going to drop her dinner or scream or maybe take all her clothes off and dance among the plates. And she was terrified because she knew she was not going to be able to stop herself. She was still terrified when she arrived at high table with Charles and Nirupam. They had all combed their heads sore and tried to clean from the fronts of their blazers the dirt which always mysteriously arrives on the fronts of blazers. But they all felt grubby and small beside the stately company at high table. There were a number of teachers and the bursar, and an important-looking man called Lord something or other, and tall, stringy Miss Cadwallader herself. Miss Cadwallader smiled at them graciously and pointed to three empty chairs at her left side. All of them instantly dived for the chair furthest away from Miss Cadwallader. 
Nan, much to her surprise, won it, and Charles won the chair in the middle, leaving Nirubam to sit beside Miss Cadwallader. "'Now we know that won't do, don't we?' said Miss Cadwallader. "'We always sit with a gentleman on either side of a lady, don't we? Dulcimer must sit in the middle, and I'll have the gentleman I haven't yet met nearest me. Clive Morgan, isn't it? That's right.' Suddenly, Charles, Nan, and Nirupam changed places. They stood there while Miss Cadwallader was saying grace, looking out over the heads of the rest of the school, not very far below, but far enough to make a lot of difference. Perhaps I'm going to faint, Nan thought hopefully. She still knew she was going to behave badly, but she felt very odd as well, and fainting was a fairly respectable way of behaving badly. She was still conscious at the end of Grace. She sat down with the rest, between the glowering Charles and Nirupam. Nirupam had gone pale yellow with dread. To their relief, Miss Cadwallader at once turned to the important Lord and began making gracious conversation with him. The ladies from the kitchen brought around a tray of little bowls and handed everybody one. What was this? It was certainly not a usual part of school dinner. They looked suspiciously at the bowls. They were full of yellow stuff, not quite covering little pink things. I believe it may be prawns, Nirupam said dubiously, for a starter. Here, Miss Cadwallader reached forth a gracious hand. Their heads at once craned around to see what implement she was going to eat out of the bowl with. Her hand picked up a fork. They picked up forks too. Nan poked hers cautiously into her bowl. Instantly, she began to behave badly. She could not stop herself. I think it's custard, she said loudly. Do prawns mix with custard? She put one of the pink things into her mouth. It felt rubbery. Chewing gum? she asked. No, I think they're jointed worms. Worms in custard. Shut up, hissed Nerupam. But it's not custard, Nan continued. She could hear her voice saying it, but there seemed no way to stop it. The tongue test proves that the yellow stuff has a strong taste of sour armpits, combined with, yes, just a touch of old drains. It comes from the bottom of a dustbin. Charles glared at her. He felt sick. If he had dared, he would have stopped eating at once, but Miss Cadwallader continued gracefully forking up prawns, unless they really were jointed worms, and Charles did not dare do differently. He wondered how he was going to put this in his journal. He had never hated Nan Pilgrim particularly before, so he had no code word for her. Prawn? Could he call her prawn? He choked down another worm, prawn, that was, and he wished he could push the whole bowlful in Nan's face. A clean yellow dustbin, Nan announced, the kind they keep the dead fish for biology in. Prawns are eaten curried in India, Nirupam said loudly. Nan knew he was trying to shut her up. With a great effort, by cramming several forkfuls of worms, prawns, that was, into her mouth at once, she managed to stop herself from talking. She could hardly bring herself to swallow the mouthful, but at least it kept her quiet. Most fervently, she hoped that the next course would be something ordinary, which she would not have any urge to describe. And so did Nirupam and Charles. But, alas, what came before them in platefuls next was one of the school kitchen's more peculiar dishes. They produced it about once a month, and its official name was Hot Pot. With it came tinned peas and tinned tomatoes. Charles's head and Nirupam's craned towards Miss Cadwallader again to see what they were supposed to eat this with. Miss Cadwallader picked up a fork. 
they picked up forks too and then craned a second time to make sure that Miss Cadwallader was not going to pick up a knife as well and so make it easier for everyone. She was not. Her fork dove gracefully under a pile of tin peas. They sighed and found both their heads turning towards Nan then in a sort of horrified expectation. They were not disappointed. As Nan levered loose the first greasy ring of potato, the urge to describe came upon her again. It was as if she was possessed. Now the aim of this dish, she said, is to use up leftovers. You take old potatoes and soak them in washing up water that has been used at least twice. The water must be thoroughly scummy. It's like the gift of tongues, she thought. Only in my case it's the gift of foul mouth. Then you take a dirty old tin and rub it around with socks that have been worn for a fortnight. You fill this tin with alternate layers of scummy potatoes and cat food, mixed with anything else you happen to have. Old doughnuts and dead flies have been used in this case. Could his code word for Nan be hot pot? Charles wondered. It suited her. No, because they only had hot pot once a month, fortunately, and at this rate he would need to hate Nan practically every day. Why didn't someone stop her? Couldn't Miss Cadwallader hear? Now these things, Nan continued, stabbing her fork into a tin tomato, are small creatures that have been killed and cleverly skinned. Notice when you taste them the slight sweet savour of their blood. Nirupam uttered a small moan and went yellower than ever. The sound made Nan look up. Hitherto she had been staring at the table where her plate was in a daze of terror. Now she saw Mr. Wentworth sitting opposite her across the table. He could hear her perfectly. She could tell from the expression on his face. Why doesn't he stop me? she thought. Why do they let me go on? Why doesn't somebody do something, like a thunderbolt strike me, or eternal detention? Why don't I get under the table and crawl away? And all the time she could hear herself talking. These did, in fact, start life as peas, but they have since undergone a long and deadly process. They lie for six months in a sewer, absorbing fluids and rich tastes, which is why they are called processed peas. Then... Here, Miss Cadwallader turned gracefully to them. Nan, to her utter relief, stopped in mid-sentence. "'You have all been long enough in the school by now,' Miss Cadwallader said, "'to know the town quite well. "'Do you know that lovely old house in High Street?' They all three stared at her. Charles gulped down a ring of potato. Lovely old house? It's called the old gatehouse, said Miss Cadwallader. It used to be part of the gate in the old town wall. A very lovely old brick building. You mean the one with a tower on top and windows like a church? Charles asked, though he could not think why Miss Cadwallader should talk of this and not processed peas. That's the one? said Miss Cadwallader. And it's such a shame. It's going to be pulled down to make way for a supermarket. You know it has a kingpin roof, don't you? Oh, said Charles, has it? And a queen pin, said Miss Cadwallader. Charles seemed to have got saddled with the conversation. Nirupam was happy enough not to talk, and Nan dared do no more than nod intelligently in case she started describing the food again. As Miss Cadwallader talked, and Charles was forced to answer while trying to eat tin tomatoes, no, they were not skinned mice, using just a fork, Charles began to feel he was undergoing a particularly refined form of torture. He realised he needed a hate word for Miss Cadwallader too. Hot pot would do for her, Surely nothing as awful as this could happen to him more than once a month. But that meant he had still not got a code word for Nan. They took the hot pot away. Charles had not eaten much. Miss Cadwallader continued to talk to him about houses in the town, then about stately homes in the country, until the pudding arrived. 
It was set before Charles, white and bleak and swimming, with little white grains in it like the corpses of ants. Lord, he was getting as bad as Nan Pilgrim. Then he realised it was the ideal word for Nan. Rice pudding, he exclaimed. It is agreeable, Miss Cadwallader said, smiling, and so nourishing. Then, incredibly, she reached to the top of her plate and picked up a fork. Charles stared. He waited. Surely Miss Cadwallader was not going to eat runny rice pudding with just a fork. But she was. She dipped the fork in and brought it up, raining weak white milk. Slowly, Charles picked up a fork, too, and turned to meet Nan's and Nirupam's incredulous faces. It was just not possible. Nirupam looked wretchedly down at his brimming plate. There is a story in the Arabian Nights, he said, about a woman who ate rice with a pin, grain by grain. Charles shot a terrified look at Miss Cadwallader, but she was talking to the Lord again. She turned out to be a ghoul, Nirupam said. She ate her fill of corpses every night. Charles's terrified look shot to Nan instead. Shut up, you fool, you'll set her off again. But the possession seemed to have left Nan by then. She was able to whisper, with her head bent over her plate so that only the boys could hear. Mr Wentworth's using his spoon, look. Do you think we dare? said Nirupam. I'm going to, said Charles. I'm hungry. So they all used their spoons. When the meal was at last over, they were all dismayed to find Mr Wentworth beckoning. But it was only Nan he was beckoning. When she came reluctantly over, he said, See me at four in my study. Which was, Nan felt, all she needed and the day was still only half over. Three. That afternoon, Nan came into the classroom to find a broom laid across her desk. It was an old, tatty broom, with only the bare minimum of twigs left in the brush end, which the groundsmen sometimes used to sweep the paths. Someone had brought it in from the groundsman's shed. Someone had tied a label to the handle. Dulcinea's Pony. Nan recognised the round, angelic writing as Teresa's. Amid sniggers and titters, she looked around the assembled faces. Teresa would not have thought of stealing a broom on her own. Estelle? No. Neither Estelle nor Karen Grigg was there. No, it was Dan Smith by the look on his face. Then she looked at Simon Silverson and was not so sure. It could not have been both of them because they never, ever did anything together. Simon said to her in his suavest manner, grinning all over his face, Why don't you hop on and have a ride, Dulcinea? Yes, go on, ride it, Dulcinea, said Dan. Next moment, everyone else was laughing and yelling at her to ride the broom. And Brian Wentworth, who was only too ready to torment other people when he was not being a victim himself, was leaping up and down in the gangway between the desks, screaming, Ride, Dulcinea, ride! Slowly, Nan picked up the broom. She was a mild and peaceable person who seldom lost her temper. Perhaps that was her trouble. But when she did lose it, there was no knowing what she would do. As she picked up the broom, she thought she just meant to stand it haughtily against the wall. But as her hands closed around its knobby handle, her temper left her completely. 
she turned around on the jeering, hooting crowd filled with roaring rage. She lifted the broom high above her head and bared her teeth. Everyone thought that was funnier than ever. Nan meant to smash the broom through Simon Silverson's laughing face. She meant to bash in Dan Smith's head. But since Brian Wentworth was dancing and shrieking and making faces just in front of her, it was Brian she went for. Luckily for him, he saw the broom coming down and leaped clear. After that, he was forced to back away up the gangway and then into the space by the door with his arms over his head, screaming for mercy while Nan followed him, bashing like a madwoman. Help! Stop her! Brian screamed and backed into the door just as Miss Hodge came through it, carrying a large pile of English books. Brian backed into her and sat down at her feet in a shower of books. Ow! he yelled. What is going on? asked Miss Hodge. The uproar in the room was cut off as if with a switch. Get up, Brian, Simon Silverson said righteously. It was your own fault for teasing Nan Pilgrim. Really, Nan, said Teresa. She was genuinely shocked. Temper, temper? At that, Nan nearly went for Teresa with the broom. Teresa was only saved by the fortunate arrival of Estelle Green and Karen Grigg. They came scurrying in with their heads guiltily lowered and their arms wrapped around bulky bags of knitting wool. Sorry we're late, Miss Hodge, Estelle panted. We had permission to go shopping. Nan's attention was distracted. The wool in the bags was fluffy and white, just like Teresa's. Why on earth, Nan wondered scornfully, did everyone have to imitate Teresa? Miss Hodge took the broom out of Nan's unresisting hands and propped it neatly behind the door. Sit down, all of you, she said. She was very put out. She had intended to come quietly into a nice, quiet classroom and galvanise 6B by confronting them with her scheme. And here they were, galvanised already, and with a witch's broom. There was clearly no chance of catching the writer of the note or the witch by surprise. Still, she did not like to let her good scheme go to waste. I thought we would have a change today, she said, when everyone was settled. Our poetry book doesn't seem to be going down very well, does it? She looked brightly round the class. 6B looked back cautiously. Some of them felt anything would be better than being asked to find poems beautiful. Some of them felt it depended on what Miss Hodge intended to do instead. Of the rest, Nan was trying not to cry. Brian was licking a scratch on his arm and Charles was glowering. Charles liked poetry because the lines were so short. You could think your own thoughts in the spaces around the print. Today, said Miss Hodge, I want you all to do something yourselves. Everyone recoiled. Estelle put her hand up. Please, Miss Hodge, I don't know how to write poems. Oh, I don't want you to do that, said Miss Hodge. Everyone relaxed. I want you to act out some little plays for me. Everyone recoiled again. Miss Hodge took no notice and explained that she was going to call them out to the front in pairs, a boy and a girl in each, and every pair was going to act out the same short scene. That way, she said, we shall have fifteen different pocket dramas. By this time, most of 6B were staring at her in wordless despair. Miss Hodge smiled around them and prepared to galvanise them. Really, she thought, her scheme might go quite well after all. Now, we must choose a subject for our playlets. It has to be something strong and striking, with passionate possibilities. Suppose we act a pair of lovers saying goodbye. Somebody groaned. As Miss Hodge had known, somebody would. Very well. Who has a suggestion? Teresa's hand was up, 
and Dan Smith's. A television star and her admirer, said Teresa. A murderer and a policeman making him confess, said Dan. Are we allowed to torture? No, we are not, said Miss Hodge, at which Dan lost interest. Anyone else? Nirupam raised a long, thin arm. Her salesman deceiving a lady over a car. Well, Miss Hodge thought, she had not really expected anyone to make a suggestion that would give them away. She pretended to consider. Well, so far the most dramatic suggestion is Dan's. But I had in mind something really tense, which we all know about quite well. We all know about murder, Dan protested. Yes, said Miss Hodge. She was watching everyone like a hawk now. But we know even more about stealing, say, or lying, or witchcraft, or... She let herself notice the broomstick again with a start of surprise. It came in handy after all. I know. Let us suppose that one of the people in our little play is suspected of being a witch and the other is an inquisitor. How about that? Nothing. Not a soul in 6B reacted, except Dan. That's the same as my idea, he grumbled, and it's no fun without torture. Miss Hodge made Dan into suspect number one at once. Then you begin, Dan, she said, with Teresa. Which are you, Teresa, witch or inquisitor? Inquisitor, Miss Hodge, Teresa said promptly. It's not fair, said Dan. I don't know what witches do. Nor did he, it was clear. And it was equally clear that Teresa had no more idea what inquisitors did. They stood woodenly by the blackboard. Dan stared at the ceiling while Teresa stated, You are a witch. Whereupon Dan told the ceiling, No, I am not. And they went on doing this until Miss Hodge told them to stop. Regretfully, she demoted Dan from first suspect to last and put Teresa down there with him and called up the next pair. Nobody behaved suspiciously. Most people's idea was to get the acting over as quickly as possible. Some argued a little for the look of the thing. Others tried running about to make things seem dramatic and first prize for brevity certainly went to Simon Silverson and Karen Grigg. Simon said, I know you're a witch, so don't argue. And Karen replied, Yes, I am. I give in. Let's stop now. By the time it came to Nirupam, Miss Hodge's list of suspects was all bottom and no top. Then Nirupam put on a terrifying performance as Inquisitor. His eyes blazed. His voice alternately roared and fell to a sinister whisper. He pointed fiercely at Estelle's face. Look at your evil eyes, he bellowed. Then he whispered, I see you, I feel you, I know you. You are a witch. Estelle was so frightened that she gave a real performance of terrified innocence. But Brian Wentworth's performance as a witch outshone even Nirupam. Brian wept, he cringed, he made obviously false excuses, and he ended kneeling at Delia Martin's feet, sobbing for mercy and crying real tears. Everyone was astonished, including Miss Hodge. She would dearly have liked to put Brian at the top of her list of suspects as either the witch or the one who wrote the note. But how bothersome for her plans if she had to go to Mr Wentworth and say it was Brian. No she decided. There was no genuine feeling in Brian's performance, and the same went for Nirupam. They were both just good actors. Then it was the turn of Charles and Nan. Charles had seen it coming for some time now that he would be paired with Nan. He was very annoyed. He seemed to be haunted by her today, but he did not intend to let that stop his performance from being a triumph of comic acting. He was depressed by the lack of invention everyone except Nirupam had shown. 
Nobody had thought of making the Inquisitor funny. I'll be Inquisitor, he said quickly. But Nan was still smarting from the broomstick. She thought Charles was getting at her and glared at him. Charles, on principle, never let anyone glare at him without giving his nastiest double-barrelled stare in return. So they shuffled to the front of the class, looking daggers at one another. There, Charles beat at his forehead. Emergency! he exclaimed. There are no witches for the autumn bonfires. I shall have to find an ordinary person instead. He pointed at Nan. You'll do, he said. Starting from now, you're a witch. Nan had not realised that the acting had begun. Besides, she was too hurt and angry to care. Oh, no, I'm not, she snapped. Why shouldn't you be the witch? Because I can prove you're a witch, Charles said, trying to stick to his part. Being an inquisitor, I can prove anything. In that case, said Nan, angrily ignoring the fine acting, we'll both be inquisitors and I'll prove you're a witch too. Why not? You have four of the most evil eyes I ever saw, and your feet smell. All eyes turned to Charles's feet. Since he had been forced to run around the field in the shoes he was wearing now, they were still rather wet, and being warmed through, they were indeed exuding a small but definite smell. Cheese, murmured Simon Silverson. Charles looked angrily down at his shoes. Nan had reminded him that he was in trouble over his missing running shoes, and she had spoiled his acting. He hated her. He was in an ecstasy of hate again. Worms and custard and dead mice, he said. Everyone stared at him, mystified. Tinned peas soaked in sewage, Charles said, beside himself with hatred. Potatoes in scum. I'm not surprised your name's Dulcinea. It suits you. You're quite disgusting. And so are you, Nan shouted back at him. I bet it was you who did those birds in music yesterday. This caused shocked gasps from the rest of 6B. Miss Hodge listened, fascinated. This was real feeling, all right. And what had Charles said? It was clear to her now why the rest of 6B had clustered so depressingly at the bottom of her list of suspects. Nan and Charles were at the top of it. It was obvious. They were always the odd ones out in 6B. Nan must have written the note, and Charles must be the witch in question. And now let Mr Wentworth pour scorn on her scheme. Please, Miss Hodge, the bell's rung, called a number of voices. The door opened, and Mr Crossley came in. When he saw Miss Hodge, which he had come early in order to do, his face became a deep red, most interesting to Estelle and Teresa. Am I interrupting a lesson, Miss Hodge? Not at all, said Miss Hodge. We had just finished. Nan and Charles, go back to your places. And she swept out of the room, without appearing to notice that Mr Crossley had leaped to hold the door open for her. Miss Hodge hurried straight upstairs to Mr Wentworth's study. She knew this news was going to make an impression on him. But there, to her annoyance, was Mr Wentworth dashing downstairs with a box of chalk very late for a lesson with 3A. Oh, Mr Wentworth, panted Miss Hodge, can you spare a moment? Not a second. Write me a memo if it's urgent, said Mr Wentworth, dashing on down. Miss Hodge reached out and seized his arm. But you must. You know 6B and my scheme about the anonymous note. Mr Wentworth swung around on the end of her clutching hands and looked up at her irritably. What about what anonymous note? My scheme worked. Miss Hodge said. Nan Pilgrim wrote it, I'm sure. You must see her. I'm seeing her at four o'clock, said Mr Wentworth. If you think I need to know, write me a memo, Miss Hodge. Eileen, said Miss Hodge. Eileen who? said Mr Wentworth, trying to pull his arm away. You mean two girls wrote this note? My name is Eileen, said Miss Hodge, hanging on. Miss Hodge, 
said Mr. Wentworth. Three A will be breaking windows by now. But there's Charles Morgan, too, Miss Hodge cried out, feeling his arm pulling out of her hands. Mr. Wentworth, I swear that boy recited a spell. Worms and custard and scummy potatoes, he said, all sorts of nasty things. Mr. Wentworth succeeded in tearing his arm loose and set off downstairs again. His voice came back to Miss Hodge. Slugs and snails and puppy dog's tails. Write it all down, Miss Hodge. Bother, said Miss Hodge. But I will write it down. He is going to notice. She went at once to the staff room, where she spent the rest of the lesson composing an account of her experiment in writing almost as round and angelic as Teresa's. Meanwhile, in the 6B classroom, Mr. Crossley shut the door behind Miss Hodge with a sigh. Journal's out, he said. He had come to a decision about the note, and he did not intend to let his feelings about Miss Hodge interfere with his duty. So, before anyone could start writing in a journal and make it impossible for him to interrupt, he made 6B a long and serious speech. He told them how malicious and sneaky and unkind it was to write anonymous accusations. He asked them to consider how they would feel if someone had written a note about them. Then he told them that someone in 6B had written just such a note. I'm not going to tell you what was in it, he said. I shall only say it accused someone of a very serious crime. I want you all to think about it while you write your journals, and after you've finished, I want the person who wrote the note to write me another note, confessing who they are and why they wrote it. That's all. I shan't punish the person. I just want them to see what a serious thing they have done. Having said this, Mr. Crossley sat back to do some marking, feeling he had settled the matter in a most understanding way. In front of him, 6B picked up their pens. Thanks to Miss Hodge, everyone thought they knew exactly what Mr. Crossley meant. 29 October, wrote Teresa. There is a witch in our class. Mr. Crossley just said so. He wants the witch to confess. Mr. Wentworth confiscated my knitting this morning and made jokes about it. I did not get it back till lunchtime. Estelle Green has started knitting now. What a copycat that girl is! Nan Pilgrim couldn't climb the ropes this morning, and her name is Dulcinea. That made us laugh a lot. 291081. Mr. Crossley has just talked to us very seriously, Simon Silverson wrote, very seriously about a guilty person in our class. I shall do my best to bring that person to justice. If we don't catch them, we might all be accused. This is off the record, of course. Nan Pilgrim is a witch, Dan Smith wrote. This is not a private thought because Mr Crossley just told us. I think she is a witch too. She is even called after the famous witch, but I can't spell it. I hope they burn her where we can see. Mr. Crossley has been talking about serious accusations, Estelle wrote, and Miss Hodge has been making us all accuse one another. It was quite frightening. I hope none of it is true. Poor Teddy went awfully red when he saw Miss Hodge, but she scorned him again. While everyone else was writing the same sort of things, there were four people in the class who were writing something quite different. Nirupam wrote... Today, no comment. I shall not even think about high table. Brian Wentworth, oblivious to everything, scribbled down how he would get from Timbuktu to Uttar Pradesh by bus, allowing time for roadworks on Sundays. Nan sat for a considerable while, wondering what to write. She wanted desperately to get some of today off her chest, but she could not at first think how to do it without saying something personal. At last she wrote in burning indignation, 
I do not know if 6b is average or not, but this is how they are. They are divided into girls and boys with an invisible line down the middle of the room, and people only cross that line when teachers make them. Girls are divided into real girls, Teresa Mullet, and imitations, Estelle Green, and me. Boys are divided into real boys, Simon Silverson, brutes, Daniel Smith, and unreal boys, Nirupam Singh, and Charles Morgan and Brian Wentworth. What makes you a real girl or boy is that no one laughs at you. If you are imitation or unreal, the rules give you a right to exist, provided you do what the real ones or brutes say. What makes you into me or Charles Morgan is that the rules allow all the girls to be better than me and all the boys better than Charles Morgan. They are allowed to cross the invisible line to prove this. Everyone is allowed to cross the invisible line to be nasty to Brian Wentworth. Nan paused here. Up to then, she had been writing almost as if she was possessed, the way she had been at lunch. Now she had to think about Brian Wentworth. What was it about Brian that put him below even her? Some of Brian's trouble, she wrote, is that Mr. Wentworth is his father, and he is small and perky and irritating with it. Another part is that Brian is really good at things, and comes top in most things, and he ought to be the real boy, not Simon. But S.S. is so certain he is the real boy that he has managed to convince Brian too. That, Nan thought, was still not quite it, but it was as near as she could get. The rest of her description of 6B struck her as masterly. She was so pleased with it that she almost forgot she was miserable. Charles wrote, I got up, I got up, I got up. That made it look as if he had sprung eagerly out of bed, which was certainly not the case. But he had so hated today that he had to work it off somehow. My running shoes got buried in cornflakes. I felt very hot running around the field, and on top of that I had lunch on high table. I do not like rice pudding. We have had games with Miss Hodge and rice pudding, and there are still about a hundred years of today to go. And that, he thought, about summed it up. When the bell rang... Mr. Crossley hurried to pick up the books he had been marking in order to get to the staff room before Miss Hodge left it. And stared. There was another note under the pile of books. It was written in the same capitals and the same blue ballpoint as the first note. It said, Ha ha, thought I was going to tell you, didn't you? Now what do I do? wondered Mr. Crossley. War. At the end of lessons, there was the usual stampede to be elsewhere. Teresa and her friends Delia, Heather, Deborah, Julia and the rest raced to the lower school girls' playroom to grab the radiators there so that they could sit on them and knit. Estelle and Karen hurried to get the chillier radiators in the corridor and sat on them to cast on their stitches. Simon led his friends to the labs where they added to Simon's collection of honour marks by helping tidy up. Dan Smith left his friends to play football without him because he had business in the shrubbery, watching the senior boys meeting their senior girlfriends there. Charles crawled reluctantly to the locker room to look for his running shoes again. Nan went equally reluctantly up to Mr. Wentworth's study. There was someone else in with Mr. Wentworth when she got there. She could hear voices and see two misty shapes through the wobbly glass in the door. Nan did not mind. The longer the interview was put off, the better. 
so she hung about in the passage for nearly twenty minutes until a passing monitor asked her what she was doing there. Waiting to see Mr. Wentworth, Nan said. Then, of course, in order to prove it to the monitor, she was forced to knock at the door. Come in, bawled Mr. Wentworth. The monitor, placated, passed on down the passage. Nan put out her hand to open the door, but before she could, it was pulled open by Mr. Wentworth himself, and Mr. Crossley came out, rather red, and laughing sheepishly. I still swear it wasn't there when I put the books down, he said. Ah, but you know you didn't look, Harold, Mr. Wentworth said. Our practical joker relied on your not looking. Forget it, Harold. So there you are, Nan. Did you lose your way here? Come on in. Mr. Crossley is just going. He went back to his desk and sat down. Mr. Crossley hovered for a moment, still rather red, and then hurried away downstairs, leaving Nan to shut the door. As she did so, she noticed that Mr. Wentworth was staring at three pieces of paper on his desk, as if he thought they might bite him. She saw that one was in Miss Hodges' writing, and that the other two were scraps of paper with blue capital letters on them. But she was much too worried on her own account to bother about pieces of writing. Explain your behaviour at high table, Mr. Wentworth said to her. Since there really was no explanation that Nan could see, she said in a miserable whisper, I can't, sir, and looked down at the parquet floor. Can't, said Mr. Wentworth. You put Lord Mulk off his lunch for no reason at all. Tell me another. Explain yourself. Miserably, Nan fitted one of her feet exactly into one of the parquet oblongs in the floor. I don't know, sir. I just said it. You don't know. You just said it, said Mr. Wentworth. Do you mean by that that you found yourself speaking without knowing you were? This was meant to be sarcasm, Nan knew. But it seemed to be true as well. Carefully, she fitted her other shoe into the parquet block which slanted towards her first foot and stood unsteadily, toe to toe, while she wondered how to explain. I didn't know what I was going to say next, sir. Why not? demanded Mr. Wentworth. I don't know, Nan said. It was like... like being possessed. Possessed! shouted Mr. Wentworth. It was the way he shouted just before he suddenly threw chalk at people. Nan went backward to avoid the chalk which came next, but she forgot that her feet were pointing inward and sat down heavily on the floor. From there she could see Mr. Wentworth's surprised face peering at her over the top of his desk. What did that? he said. Please don't throw chalk at me, Nan said. At that moment there was a knock at the door, and Brian Wentworth put his head around it into the room. Are you free yet, Dad? No, said Mr. Wentworth. Both of them looked at Nan, sitting on the floor. What's she doing? Brian asked. She says she's possessed. Go away and come back in ten minutes, Mr. Wentworth said. Get up, Nan. Brian obediently shut the door and went away. Nan struggled to her feet. It was almost as difficult as climbing a rope. She wondered a little how it felt to be Brian with your father, one of the teachers, but mostly she wondered what Mr. Wentworth was going to do to her. He had on his most harrowed, worried look, and he was staring again at the three papers on his desk. So you think you're possessed, he said. Oh, no, Nan said. All I meant was it was like it. I knew I was going to do something awful before I started, but I didn't know what until I started describing the food. Then I tried to stop, and I couldn't somehow. 
Do you often get taken that way? Mr. Wentworth asked. Nan was about to answer indignantly, No, when she realised that she had gone for Brian with the witch's broom in exactly the same way straight after lunch, and many and many a time she had impulsively written things in her journal. She fitted her shoe into a parquet block again and hastily took it away. Sometimes, she said in a low, guilty mutter, I do sometimes, when I'm angry with people. I write what I think in my journal. And do you write notes to teachers too? asked Mr. Wentworth. Of course not, said Nan. What would be the point? But someone in 6B has written Mr. Crossley a note, said Mr. Wentworth. It accused someone in the class of being a witch. The serious, worried way he said it made Nan understand at last. So that was why Mr. Crossley had talked like that and then been to see Mr. Wentworth. And they thought Nan had written the note. The unfairness! she burst out. How can they think I wrote the note and called me a witch too, just because my name's Dulcinea? You could be diverting suspicion from yourself, Mr. Wentworth pointed out. If I asked you straight out, I am not a witch, said Nan, and I didn't write that note. I bet that was Teresa Mullet or Simon Silverson. They're both born accusers. Or Daniel Smith she added. Now, I wouldn't have picked on Dan, Mr. Wentworth said. I wasn't aware he could write. The sarcastic way he said that showed Nan that she ought not to have mentioned Teresa or Simon. Like everyone else, Mr. Wentworth thought of them as the real girl and the real boy. Someone accused me, she said bitterly. Well, I'll take your word for it that you didn't write the note, Mr. Wentworth said. And next time you feel a possession coming on, take a deep breath and count up to ten, or you may be in serious trouble. You have a very unfortunate name, you see. You'll have to be very careful in future. How did you come to be called Dulcinea? Were you called after the Archwitch? Yes, Nan admitted. I'm descended from her. Mr. Wentworth whistled. And you're a witch orphan too, aren't you? I shouldn't let anyone else know that, if I were you. I happen to admire Dulcinea Wilkes for trying to stop witches being persecuted, but very few other people do. Keep your mouth shut, Nan, and don't ever describe food in front of Lord Mulk again either. Off you go now. Nan fumbled her way out of the study and plunged down the stairs. Her eyes were so fuzzy with indignation that she could hardly see where she was going. What does he take me for? she muttered to herself as she went. I'd rather admit to being descended from... from Attila the Hun, or... or Guy Fawkes, or anyone. It was around that time that Mr. Towers, who had stood over Charles while Charles hunted unavailingly for his running shoes in the boys' locker room, finally smothered a long yawn and left Charles to go on looking by himself. Bring them to me in the staff room when you've found them, he said. Charles sat down on a bench, alone among grey lockers and green walls. He glowered at the slimy grey floor and the three odd football boots that always lay in one corner. He looked at nameless garments withering on pegs. He sniffed the smell of sweat and old socks. I hate everything, he said. He had searched everywhere. Dan Smith had found a really cunning place for those shoes. The only way Charles was going to find them was by Dan telling him where they were. Charles ground his teeth and stood up. All right, then I'll ask him, he said. Like everyone else, he knew Dan was in the shrubbery spying on seniors. Dan made no secret of it. 
He had got his uncle to send him a pair of binoculars so that he could get a really close view. And the shrubbery was only around the corner from the locker room. Charles thought he could risk going there, even if Mr Towers suddenly came back. The real risk was from the seniors in the shrubbery. There was an invisible line around the shrubbery, just like the one Nan had described between the boys and the girls in 6B. Anyone younger than a senior who got found in the shrubbery could be most thoroughly beaten up by the senior who found them. Still, Charles thought as he set off, Dan was not a senior either. That should help. The shrubbery was a messy tangle of huge evergreen bushes with wet grass in between. Charles's almost dry shoes were soaked again before he found Dan. He found him quite quickly. Since it was a cold evening and the grass was so wet, there were only two pairs of seniors there, and they were all in the most trodden part, on either side of a mighty laurel bush. Ah, thought Charles. He crept to the laurel bush and pushed his face in among the wet and shiny leaves. Dan was there, among the dry branches inside. Dan, whispered Charles. Dan took his binoculars from his eyes with a jerk and whirled around. When he saw Charles's face leaning in among the leaves at him, beaming its nastiest double-barrelled glare, he seemed almost relieved. Pig off, he whispered. Magic out of here. What have you done with my spikes? said Charles. Whisper, can't you? Dan whispered. He peered nervously through the leaves at the nearest pair of seniors. Charles could see them too. They were a tall, thin boy and a very fat girl, much fatter than Nan Pilgrim, and they did not seem to have heard anything. Charles could see the thin boy's fingers digging into the girl's fat where his arm was around her. He wondered how anyone could enjoy grabbing or watching such fatness. Where have you hidden my spikes? he whispered. But Dan did not care, as long as the seniors had not heard. I've forgotten, he whispered. Beyond the bush, the thin boy leaned his head against the fat girl's head. Dan grinned. See that? Mixing the breed. He put his binoculars to his eyes again. Charles spoke a little louder. Tell me where you've put my spikes or I'll shout that you're here. Then they'll know you're here too, won't they? Dan whispered. I told you, magic off. Not till you tell me, said Charles. Charles saw that he had no option but to raise a yell and fetch the seniors into the bush. While he was wondering whether he dared, the second pair of seniors came hurrying around the laurel bush. Hey, said the boy, there's some juniors in that bush. Sue heard them whispering. Right, said the thin boy and the fat girl, and all four seniors dived at the bush. Charles let out a squawk of terror and ran. Behind him, he heard cracking branches, leaves swishing, grunts, crunchings, and most unladylike threats from the senior girls. He hoped Dan had been caught, but even while he was hoping, he knew Dan had gotten away. Charles was in the open. The seniors had seen him, and it was Charles they were after. He burst out of the shrubbery with all four of them after him. With a finger across his nose to hold his glasses on, he pelted for his life around the corner of the school. There was nothing in front of him but a long wall and open space. The lower school door was a hundred yards away. The only possible place that was any nearer was the open door of the boys' locker room. Charles bolted through it without thinking and skidded to a stop realising what a fool he had been. The senior's feet were hammering around the corner and the only way out of the locker room was the open door he had come in by. All Charles could think of was to dodge behind that door and stand there, flat against the wall, hoping. There he stood, flattened and desperate, breathing in old sock and mildew and trying not to pant while four pairs of feet slid to a stop outside the door. He's hiding in there said the fat girl's voice. We can't go in, it's boys, 
said the other girl. You two go and bring him out. There were breathless grunts from the two boys, and two pairs of heavy feet tramped in through the doorway. The thin boy, by the sound, tramped into the middle of the room. His voice rumbled around the concrete space. Where's he gotten to? Must be behind the door, rumbled the other. The door was pulled aside. Charles stood petrified at the sight of the senior it revealed. This one was huge. He towered over Charles. He even had a sort of moustache. Charles shook with terror. But the little angry eyes, high up above the moustache, stared down through Charles, seemingly at the floor and the wall. The bulky face twitched in annoyance. Nope, said the senior. Nothing here. He must have made it to the lower school door, said the thin boy. Magicking little witch, said the other. And to Charles's utter amazement, the two of them tramped out of the locker room. There was some annoyed exclaiming from the two girls outside, and then all four of them seemed to be going away. Charles stood where he was, shaking, for quite a while after they seemed to have gone. He was sure it was a trick. But five minutes later, they had still not come back. It was a miracle of some kind. Charles tottered out into the middle of the room, wondering just what kind of miracle it was that could make a huge senior look straight through you. Now he knew it had happened, Charles was sure the senior had not been pretending. He really had not seen Charles standing there. So what did it? Charles asked the nameless hanging clothes. Magic? He meant it to be a scornful question, the kind of thing you say when you give the whole thing up. But somehow it was not. As he said it, a huge, terrible suspicion which had been gathering almost unnoticed at the back of Charles's head, like a headache coming on, now swung to the front of his mind, like a headache already there. Charles began shaking again. No, he said, it wasn't that. It was something else. But the suspicion, now it was there, demanded to be sent away at once, now, completely. All right, Charles said, I'll prove it. I know how. I hate Dan Smith anyway. He marched up to Dan's locker and opened it. He looked at the jumble of clothes and shoes inside. He had searched his locker twice now. He had searched all of them twice. He was sick of looking in lockers. He took up Dan's spiked running shoes, one in each hand, and backed away with them to the middle of the room. Now, he said to the shoes, you vanish. He tapped them together, sole to spiked sole, to make it clear to them. Vanish, he said, abracadabra. And when nothing happened, he threw both shoes into the air to give them every chance. Hey, presto, he said. Both shoes were gone in mid-air before they reached the slimy floor. Charles stared at the spot where he had last seen them. I didn't mean it, he said hopelessly. Come back. Nothing happened. No shoes appeared. Oh, well, said Charles. Perhaps I did mean it. Then, very gently, almost reverently, he went over and shut Dan's locker. The suspicion was gone. But the certainty which hung over Charles in its place was so heavy and so hideous that it made him want to crouch on the floor. He was a witch. He would be hunted like the witch he had helped and burned like the fat one. It would hurt. It would be horrible. He was very, very scared. So scared it was like being dead already, cold, heavy and almost unable to breathe. Trying to pull himself together, he took his glasses off to clean them. That made him notice that he was actually crouching on the floor beside Dan's locker. He dragged himself upright. What should he do? 
Might not the best thing be to get it over now and go straight to Miss Cadwallader and confess? That seemed an awful waste, but Charles could not seem to think of anything else to do. He shuffled to the door and out into the chilly evening. He had always known he was wicked, he thought. Now it was proved. The witch had kissed him because she had known he was evil too. Now he had grown so evil that he needed to be stamped out. He wouldn't give the Inquisitors any trouble, not like some witches did. Witchcraft must show all over him anyway. Someone had already noticed and written that note about it. Nan Pilgrim had accused him of conjuring up all those birds in music yesterday. Charles thought he must have done that without knowing he had, just as he had made himself invisible to the seniors just now. He wondered how strong a witch he was. Were you more wicked the stronger you were? Probably. But weak or powerful, you were burned just the same. And he was in nice time for the autumn bonfires. It was nearly Halloween now. By the time they had legally proved him a witch, it would be November the 5th, and that would be the end of it. He did not know it was possible to feel so scared and hopeless. Thinking and thinking, in a haze of horror, Charles shuffled his way to Miss Cadwallader's room. He stood outside the door and waited, without even the heart to knock. Minutes passed. The door opened. Seeing the misty oblong of bright light, Charles braced himself. So you didn't find them, said Mr. Towers. Charles jumped. Though he could not see what Mr. Towers was doing here, he said, No, sir. I'm not surprised if you took your glasses off to look, said Mr. Towers. Tremulously, Charles hooked his glasses over his ears. They were ice cold. He must have had them in his hand ever since he took them off to clean. Now that he could see, he saw he was standing outside the staff room, not Miss Cadwallader's room at all. Why was that? Still, he could just as easily confess to Mr. Towers, Please, I deserve to be punished, sir. I... Take a black mark for that, Mr. Towers said coldly. I don't like boys who crawl. Now, either you can pay for a new pair of shoes, or you can write 500 lines every night until the end of the term. Come to me tomorrow morning and tell me which you decide to do. Now get out of here. He slammed the door of the staff room in Charles's face. Charles stood and looked at it. That was a fierce choice Mr. Towers had given him, and a black mark. But it had jolted his horror off sideways somehow. He felt his face going red. What a fool he was! Nobody knew he was a witch. Instinct had told him this, and taken his feet to the staff room instead of to Miss Cadwallader. But only luck had saved him confessing to Mr. Towers. He had better not be that stupid again. As long as he kept his mouth shut and worked no more magic, he would be perfectly safe. He almost smiled as he trudged off to supper. But he could not stop thinking about it. Around and around and around, all through supper. How wicked was he? Could he do anything about it? Was it enough just not to do any magic? Could you go somewhere and be demagic, like clothes were dry cleaned? If not, and he was found out, was it any use running away? Where did witches run to after they had run through people's backyards? Was there any certain way of being safe? Oh, magic, someone exclaimed just beside him. I left my book in the playroom. Charles jumped and hummed like the school gong when it was hit at the mere word. Don't swear, said the monitor in charge. Then Teresa Mullet, from the end of the table, called out in a way that was not quite jeering. Nan, won't you do something interesting and miraculous for us? We know you can. Charles jumped and hummed again. No, I can't said Nan. But Teresa, and Delia Martin too, kept on asking, 
Nan, High Table's got some lovely bananas. Won't you say a spell and fetch them over? Nan, I feel like some ice cream. Conjure some up. Nan, do you really worship the devil? Each time they said any of these things, Charles jumped and hummed. Though he knew it was entirely to his advantage to have everyone think Nan Pilgrim was the witch, he wanted to scream at the girls to stop. He was very relieved halfway through supper when Nan jumped up and stormed out of the dining room. Nan went straight to the deserted library. Very well, she thought. If everyone was so sure she was guilty, she could at least take advantage of it and do something she had always wanted to do and never dared to do before. She took down the encyclopedia and looked up Dulcinea Wilkes. Curiously enough, the fat book fell open at that page. It seemed as if a lot of people at Larwood House had taken an interest in the Archwitch. If so, they had all been as disappointed as Nan. The laws against witchcraft were so severe that most information about Nan's famous ancestress was banned. The entry was quite short. Wilkes, Dulcinea, 1760 to 1790. Notorious witch, known as the Arch Witch. Born in Steeple Bumstead, Essex, she moved to London in 1781, where she soon became well known for her nightly broomstick flights around St Paul's and the Houses of Parliament. Brooms are still sometimes called Dulcinea's ponies. Dulcinea took a leading part in the witches' uprising of 1789. She was arrested and burned, along with the other leaders. While she was burning, it is said that the lead on the roof of St Paul's melted and ran off the dome. She continued to be burned in effigy every bonfire day until 1845, when the practice was discontinued owing to the high price of lead. Nan sighed and put the encyclopedia back. When the bell rang, she went slowly to the classroom to do the work that had been set during the day. It was called Devi at Larwood House. No one knew why. Everyone else was there when Nan arrived. The room was full of the slap of exercise books around Brian Wentworth's head and Brian squealing. But the noise stopped as Nan came in, showing that Mr Crossley had come in behind her. Charles Morgan, said Mr Crossley, Mr Wentworth wants to see you. Charles dragged his mind with a jolt from imaginary flames whirling around him. He got up and trudged off like a boy in a dream, along corridors and through swinging doors to the part of the school where teachers who lived in the school had their private rooms. He had only been to Mr Wentworth's room once before. He had to tear his mind away from thoughts of burning and look at the names on the doors. He supposed Mr Wentworth wanted him because of his beastly shoes. Blast and magic, Dan Smith! He knocked on the door. Come in, said Mr Wentworth. He was sitting in an armchair, smoking a pipe. The room was full of strong smoke. Charles was surprised to see how shabby Mr Wentworth's room was. The armchair was worn out. There were holes in the soles of Mr Wentworth's slippers and holes in the hearth rug the slippers rested on. But the gas fire was churring away comfortably and the room was beautifully warm compared with the rest of school. Ah, Charles! Mr Wentworth laid his pipe in an ashtray that looked like Brian's first attempt at pottery. Charles, I was told this afternoon that you might be a witch. I've. Charles had thought in the locker room that he had been as frightened as a person could possibly be. Now he discovered this was not so. Mr Wentworth's words seemed to hit him heavy separate blows. Under the blows, Charles felt as if he were dissolving and falling away somewhere far, far below. 
He thought at first he was falling somewhere so sickeningly deep that the whole of his mind had become one long, horrible scream. Then he felt he was rising up as he screamed. The shabby room was blurred and swaying, but Charles could have sworn he was now looking down on it from somewhere near the ceiling. He seemed to be hanging there, screaming, looking down on the top of his own head and the slightly bald top of Mr Wentworth's head and the smoke writhing from the pipe in the ashtray. And that terrified him too. He must have divided into two parts. Mr Wentworth was bound to notice. To his surprise, the part of himself left standing on the worn carpet answered Mr Wentworth quite normally. He heard his own voice, with just the right amount of amazement and innocence, saying, Who, me? I'm not a witch, sir. I didn't say you were, Charles, Mr Wentworth replied. I just said someone said you were. From the account I was given, you had a public row with Nan Pilgrim, in the course of which you spoke of worms and dead mice, and a number of other unpleasant things. The part of Charles, left standing on the carpet, answered indignantly, Well, I did, but I was only saying some of the things she said at lunch. You were there, sir. Didn't you hear her, sir? Meanwhile, the part of Charles hovering near the ceiling was thanking whatever lucky stars looked after witches that Mr Wentworth had chanced to sit opposite Nan Pilgrim at high table. I did, said Mr Wentworth. I recognised your reference at once, but my informant thought you were reciting a spell. But I wasn't, sir, protested the part of Charles on the carpet. But you sounded as if you were, Mr Wentworth said. You can't be too careful, Charles, in these troubled times. It sounds as if I'd better explain the position to you. He picked up his pipe to help him in the explanation. In the way of pipes, it had gone out by then. Mr Wentworth struck matches and puffed, and struck more matches and puffed. Smoke does not seem to mean fire where pipes are concerned. Mr Wentworth used ten matches before the pipe was alight. As Charles watched, it dawned on him that Mr Wentworth did not think he was a witch nor did Mr Wentworth seem to have noticed the odd way he had split into two. Perhaps the part of him hovering near the ceiling was imaginary and simply due to panic. As Charles thought this, he found the part of him near the ceiling slowly descending into the part of him standing normally on the carpet. By the time Mr Wentworth risked putting his pipe out again by pressing the matchbox down on it, Charles found himself in one piece. He was still fizzing all over with terror, it is true, but he was feeling nothing like so peculiar. Now, Charles, said Mr Wentworth, you know witchcraft has always been illegal, but I think it's true to say that the laws against it have never been as strict as they are now. You've heard of the witches' uprising, of course, in 1789, under the arch-witch Dulcinea Wilkes? Charles nodded. Everyone knew about Dulcinea. It was like being asked if you knew about Guy Fawkes. Now that, said Mr Wentworth, was a respectable sort of uprising in its way. The witches were protesting against being persecuted and burned. Dulcinea said reasonably enough that they couldn't help being born the way they were and they didn't want to be killed for something they couldn't help. She kept promising that witches would use their powers only for good if people would stop burning them. Dulcinea wasn't at all the awful creature everyone says, you know. She was young and pretty and clever, but she had a terribly hot temper. When people wouldn't agree not to burn witches, she lost her temper and worked a number of huge and violent spells. That was a mistake. It made people absolutely terrified of witchcraft, and when the uprising was put down, there were an awful lot of bonfires and some really strict laws. But you'll know all that. Charles nodded again. Apart from the fact that he had been taught that Dulcinea was an evil old hag and a stupid one, this was what everyone knew. 
But, said Mr. Wentworth, pointing his pipe at Charles, what you may not know is that there was another, much more unpleasant uprising just before you were born. Surprised? Yes, I thought you were. It was hushed up, rather. The witches leading it were all unpleasant people, and their aim was to take over the country. The main conspirators were all civil servants and army generals, and the leader was a cabinet minister. You can imagine how scared and shocked everyone was at that. Yes, sir, said Charles. He had almost stopped being frightened by now. He found himself trying to imagine the Prime Minister as a witch. It was an interesting idea. Mr. Wentworth put his pipe in his mouth and puffed out smoke expressively. The minister was burned in Trafalgar Square, he said, and Parliament passed the Witchcraft Emergency Act in an effort to stamp out witches for good. That act, Charles, is still in force today. It gives the Inquisitors enormous powers. They can arrest someone on the mere suspicion of witchcraft, even if they're only your age, Charles. My age? Charles said hoarsely. Yes. Witches keep on being born, said Mr. Wentworth. And it was discovered that the minister's family had known he was a witch since he was eleven years old. A lot of research has been done since on witches. There are a hundred different kinds of witch detectors, but most of the research has been towards discovering when witches first come into their powers, and it seems that most witches start at around your age, Charles. So these days the Inquisitors keep a special eye on all schools. And a school like this one, where at least half the pupils are witch orphans anyway, is going to attract their notice at once. Understand? No, sir, said Charles. Why are you telling me? Someone thought you recited a spell, Mr. Wentworth said. Think, boy. If I hadn't happened to know what you were really saying, you'd be under arrest by now. So now you'll have to be extra specially careful. Now do you see? Yes, sir, said Charles. He was almost frightened again. Then off you go, back to Devy, said Mr. Wentworth. Charles turned around and trudged over the threadbare carpet to the door. And Charles, called Mr. Wentworth. Charles turned around. Take a black mark to remind you to be careful, said Mr. Wentworth. Charles opened the door. Two black marks in one evening. If you got three black marks in a week, you went to Miss Cadwallader and were in real trouble. Two black marks, both for things which were not his fault. Charles turned around while he was closing the door and directed the full force of his nastiest double-barrelled glare at Mr. Wentworth. He was seething. He trudged up the corridor to the swinging door, still seething. The swinging door swung as he reached it, and to his surprise, Miss Hodge came through it. Miss Hodge did not live in school. As Estelle had speedily found out and told everyone, she lived with her old father in town. She was not usually here in the evenings at all. Charles, said Miss Hodge, how convenient. Have you been seeing Mr. Wentworth? It did not occur to Charles to wonder how Miss Hodge knew that. In his experience, teachers always knew far too much anyway. Yes, he said. Then you can tell me which his room is, said Miss Hodge. Charles pointed out the room and applied his shoulder to the swinging door. He had just forced his way out into the corridor beyond when it swung again and again let Miss Hodge through. Charles, are you sure Mr. Wentworth was there? He didn't answer when I knocked. He was sitting by his fire, Charles said. Then perhaps I knocked at the wrong door, Miss Hodge said. Can you come and show me? Would you mind very much? Yes, I would mind, Charles thought. He sighed and went back through the swinging door with Miss Hodge. Miss Hodge seemed pleased to have his company, which surprised him a little. 
Miss Hodge was thinking how fortunate it was she had met Charles. Since the afternoon, she had been thinking carefully, and she saw that her next and most certain move towards marrying Mr. Wentworth was to go to him and impulsively take back her accusation against Charles. It was unpleasant to think of anyone being burned, even if Charles did have the most evil glare of any boy she knew. She would look so generous. And here she was, actually with Charles, to prove she bore him no malice. Charles looked at Mr. Wentworth's name on the door and wondered how Miss Hodge could have gotten the wrong room. Oh, said Miss Hodge, it was the right door. That's his name. She knocked and knocked again with golden visions of her romance with Mr. Wentworth growing as together they tried to protect Charles from the clutches of the Inquisitors. But there was no answer from the room. She turned to Charles in perplexity. Maybe he's gone to sleep, Charles said. It was warm in there. Suppose we open the door and take a peep, Miss Hodge said, fluttering a little. You do it, said Charles. No, you, said Miss Hodge. I'll take all responsibility. Charles sighed and opened Mr. Wentworth's door for the second time that evening. A gust of cold, smoky air blew in their faces. The room was dark, except for a faint glow from the cooling gas fire. Even that vanished when Miss Hodge imperiously switched on the light and stood fanning the smoke away from her. Dear, dear, she said, looking around. That man needs a woman's hand here. Are you sure he was here, Charles? Just this minute, Charles said doggedly. But horror was beginning to descend on him. It was almost as if Mr. Wentworth had never been. He walked over to the bald patch of carpet in front of the fire and felt the fire. It was quite hot. Mr. Wentworth's pipe was lying in the pottery ashtray still, and that was warm too, but cooling in the icy air from the open window. Perhaps, Charles thought hopefully, Mr. Wentworth had just felt tired and gone to bed. There was a door in the opposite wall beyond the blowing curtains of the window, which was probably the door to his bedroom. But Miss Hodge boldly walked over and opened that door. It was a cupboard, stuffed with school books. He didn't go this way, she said. Has he a bedroom along the corridor, do you know? He must have, said Charles. But he knew Mr. Wentworth had not gone down the corridor. He could not have come out of this room without Charles seeing him as he went to the swinging door, or Miss Hodge seeing him as she pushed past Charles the other way. There was only one other possibility. Charles had looked daggers at Mr. Wentworth. He had given him his very nastiest glare. And that glare had caused Mr. Wentworth to disappear, just as Dan's running shoes had disappeared. It was what they called the evil eye. I don't think there's any point in waiting, Miss Hodge said discontentedly. Oh, well, I can speak to him tomorrow. Charles was only too glad to go. He was only too glad to accompany Miss Hodge down to the door where she had left her bicycle. He talked to her most politely all the way. It kept his mind off what he had done. And he thought that if he talked hard enough and made himself truly charming, Miss Hodge might not realise that Charles had been the last person to set eyes on Mr. Wentworth. They talked of poems, football, bicycles, the caretaker's dog and Mr. Hodge's garden. The result was that Miss Hodge mounted her bicycle and rode off, thinking that Charles Morgan was a very nice child once you got to know him. It made it all the better that she intended to withdraw her accusation against him. A teacher, she told herself, should always try to get to know her pupils. Charles puffed out a big sigh of relief and trudged off again, weighted with new guilt. By the time he reached the classroom, nearly all the others had finished their work and were trooping off to choir practice. Charles had the room to himself, apart from Nan Pilgrim, who also seemed to be behindhand. 
They did not speak to one another, of course, but it was doubtful that either did much work. Nan was thinking miserably that if only she was a witch like Dulcinea Wilkes, she would not mind what anyone said. Charles was thinking about Mr. Wentworth. First the birds in music, now Mr. Wentworth. Being invisible to the senior didn't count because no one knew about that. What terrified Charles was that he would seem to keep using witchcraft by accident, where it showed. If only he could stop himself doing that, then he still might have a chance. Miss Hodge might give him an alibi over Mr. Wentworth if he went on being nice to her. But how did you stop yourself working magic? This has been an awful day, Nan said as she packed up to leave. I'm so glad it's nearly over. Charles stared at her, wondering how she knew. Then he packed up and left too. He was very much afraid that today was not over for him yet by a long way. He had heard the Inquisitors usually came for you in the night, so they would come for him as soon as someone discovered Mr. Wentworth was missing. Charles thought about Mr. Wentworth all the time he was washing. He had rather liked Mr. Wentworth on the whole. He felt very bad about him. Perhaps the way to stop himself doing it again to Mr. Crossley or someone was to think hard about how it felt to be burned. It would hurt. It hurts to be burned, he repeated to himself as he undressed. It hurts to be burned. He was shivering as he climbed into bed, and not only from the cold air in the long Spartan dormitory. Brian Wentworth was being beaten up again a few beds along from him. Brian was crouching on his bed with his arms over his head, while Simon Silverson and his friends hit him with their pillows. They were laughing, but they meant it too. Show off, they were saying. Boot liquor, show off. Up till then, Charles had always been almost glad he was in this dormitory and not in the one next door like Nirupam, where Dan Smith ruled with his friends from 6C and 6D. Now he wondered whether to sneak off and sleep in the lower school boys' playroom. Brian's yells, for Brian could never be hit quietly, kept cutting through Charles's miserable meditations and reminding him what he had done to Brian's father. It grew so bothersome that Charles nearly got out of bed and joined in hitting Brian too, just to relieve his feelings. But by this time he had gathered the reason for the pillows. Mr Brubeck had asked Brian to sing a solo at the school concert and Brian had unwisely agreed. Everyone else knew that it was Simon's right to sing solo. This meant that hitting Brian would be sucking up to Simon. That Charles would not do. He went back to his desperate wonderings. There was no way of keeping Mr Wentworth's disappearance secret that he could see. But there was quite a chance that no one would realise Charles had done it. So if only he could think of some surefire way of stopping himself working magic by accident, that was it! Sure fire! It hurts to be burned! Charles got out of bed. He unhooked his glasses from his bed rail, hooked them on his ears, and thumped across to the flurry of pillows. Can I borrow the emergency candle for five minutes? He said loudly to Simon. Simon, of course, was dormitory monitor. He paused in belabouring Brian and became official. The candle's only for emergencies. What do you want it for? You'll see if you give it to me, said Charles. Simon hesitated, torn between curiosity and his usual desire never to give anyone anything. You'll have to tell me what you want it for first. I can't let you have it for no reason. I'm not going to tell you, said Charles. Just give it to me. Simon considered. Long experience of Charles Morgan had shown him that when Charles said he was not going to tell, nothing would make him tell, not pillows or even wild horses. His curiosity, as Charles had hoped, was thoroughly aroused. If I give it to you, he said righteously, 
I shall be breaking the rules. You owe me compensation for risking getting into trouble, you know. This was only to be expected. What do you want? said Charles. Simon smiled graciously, wondering how great Charles's need was. Your pocket money every week for the rest of term, he said. How about that? Too much, said Charles. Simon turned away and picked up his pillow again. Take it or leave it, he said. That's my final offer. I'll take it, said Charles, hating Simon. Simon turned back to him in astonishment. He had expected Charles either to protest or give up asking. His friends stared at Charles, equally astonished. In fact, by this time, nobody was hitting Brian any more. Here was something really odd going on. Even Brian was staring at Charles. How could anyone want a candle that much? Very well, Simon said. I'll accept your offer, Charles. But remember, you promised in front of witnesses you'd better pay up. I'll pay up, said Charles. Every week when Mr. Crossley gives us our money, now give me the candle. Simon, with busy efficiency, fetched his keyring from his blazer and unlocked the cupboard on the wall where the first aid kit and the candle were kept. If a miracle happened, Charles thought, and the Inquisitors did not come for him after all, he had put himself in a true mess now. No pocket money until Christmas. That meant he could not pay for new running shoes. He would have to write 500 lines every day for Mr. Towers. But he did not really believe he would be around to do that very long. Everyone said the Inquisitors found witches, whatever they did. Simon put the candle in his hands. It was unlit in a white enamel candle holder. Charles looked at it. He looked up to see Simon and all the other boys, even Brian, grinning. You forgot to ask for matches, Simon pointed out. Charles looked at him. He glared. He did more than glare. It was the nastiest look he had ever given anyone. He hoped it would shrivel Simon on the spot. All that happened was that Simon stepped backward from him. Even so, he looked as superior as ever. But I'll give you the matches free, he said. It's all part of the service. He tossed a box of matches toward Charles. Charles put the candlestick down on the floor. With everyone staring at him, he struck a match and lit the candle. He knelt down beside it. It hurts to be burned, he thought. It hurts to be burned. He put out his finger and held it in the small yellow flame. Why on earth are you doing that? asked Ronald West. Charles did not answer. For a second, he thought the flame was not going to burn him. It just felt warm and wet. Then, quite suddenly, it was hot, and it hurt very much indeed. It hurt, as Charles had expected, in quite a different way from cutting yourself or stubbing your toe. This was a much nastier pain, sharp and dull together which brought Charles's bag out in goose pimples and jangled the nerves all the way up his arm. Imagine this all over you, he thought. It hurts to be burned. He took hold of his wrist with his other hand and held it hard to stop himself snatching his finger out of the pain. It hurts to be burned. It did hurt too. It was making sweat prickle out just beneath his eyes. It must be for a dare or a bet, he heard Simon saying. Which is it? Tell or I'll put the candle away again. A bet, Charles answered at random. It hurts to be burned. It hurts to be burned. He thought this over and over, intent on branding it into his brain or into whatever part of him it was that did magic. It hurts to be... Oh, it hurts! Hurts to be burned! Some people, Simon remarked, make awfully stupid bets.
nuts. Charles ignored him and tried to keep his jerking finger steady. It was trying to jump out of the flame of its own accord. The finger was now red, with a white band across the red. He could hear a funny noise, a sort of tiny frizzling, as if his skin were frying. Then suddenly he could bear no more. He found himself snatching his finger away and blowing out the candle. The boys watching him all let out a sigh, as if they had been holding their breath. I suppose, Simon said discontentedly, as Charles handed him the candle back, you make more money on this bet than you owe me now. No, I don't, Charles said quickly. He was afraid Simon would be after that money too. Simon was quite capable of telling Mr Crossley about the candle if Charles did not pay. I don't get anything. The bet was to burn my finger right off. The monitor on duty appeared in the doorway, shouting, Lights out! No more talking! Charles got into bed, sucking his burned finger, hoping and praying that he had now taught himself not to work magic by accident. His tongue could feel a big, pulpy blister rising between the first and second joint of his finger. It hurt more than ever. Simon said out of the darkness, I always knew Charles Morgan was mad. What a brainless thing to do. Ronald West said, You don't expect brains in an animal. Animals have more sense, said Geoffrey Baines. Charles Morgan, said Simon, is a lower life form. These kinds of comments went on for some time. It was perfectly safe to talk because there was always such a noise from the next dormitory. Charles lay and waited for them to stop. He knew he was not going to sleep, nor did he. Long after Simon and his friends had fallen silent, long after two monitors and the master in charge had come along and shut up the boys next door, Charles lay stiff as a log of wood, staring up into the shadows. He was frightened, terrified, but the terror was now a dreary, long-distance kind of terror, which he was sure he was going to feel all the time for the rest of his life now. Suppose, by some miracle, no inquisitors came for him. Then he was going to be afraid that they would every minute of every day for years and years. He wondered if you learned to get used to it. He hoped so, because at this moment he felt like springing out of bed and confessing just to get it over. What would Simon say if Charles jumped up, shouting, I'm a witch? Probably he would think Charles was mad. It was funny that Simon had not disappeared too. Charles sucked his finger and puzzled over that. He certainly hated Simon enough. He had not hated Mr Wentworth at all, really, or only in the way you hate any master who gives you a black mark you do not deserve. Perhaps witchcraft had to be sort of clinical to work properly. Then Charles thought of his other troubles. Two black marks in one day, no running shoes, no money, 500 lines a day, and none of it was his fault. It was not his fault he had been born a witch either, for that matter. It was all so unfair. He wished he did not have to feel so guilty about Mr Wentworth on top of it all. It hurts to be burned. Charles's thoughts slowly grew less connected after this point. He realised afterward that he must have been asleep. But if it was sleep, it was only a light, horrified doze in which his thoughts kept on clanking about in his head as if he were a piece of machinery with the switch jammed to on. But he did not know he had been asleep. It seemed to him at the time that he sat up in bed after thinking things out in a perfectly orderly way. It was all quite obvious. He was a witch. He dared not be found out. Therefore, he had to use some more witchcraft in order not to be found out. In other words, he had better go somewhere private, like the toilets downstairs, and conjure up first Mr Wentworth, and then his running shoes.
Charles got up. He remembered to put on his glasses. He even thought of arranging his bedclothes in heaps to make it look as if he was still in bed. He could see to do that by the dim light shining in from the corridor. By that light, he could see to creep past the sleeping humps of all the other boys. He crept out into the corridor, which seemed light as day by comparison. There was a lot of noise coming from the next dormitory. There was rustling and some heavy thumps, followed by some giggles hurriedly choked off. Charles stopped. It sounded as if they were having one of their midnight feasts in there. The thumps would be the floorboards coming up so that they could get at their hidden food. It was a bad time to wander about. If the master in charge heard the noise, Charles would be caught too. But the corridor remained empty. After a while, Charles dared to go on. He went along the corridor and down the dark pit of the concrete stairs at the end. It was cold. The heating, which was never warm anyway, was turned down for the night. The chill, striking up through Charles's bare feet and in through his pyjamas, served to wake him up a little. He wondered if it was the pain in his finger which had awakened him in the first place. It was throbbing steadily. Charles held it against the cold wall to soothe it, and while his feet felt their way from stair to cold stair, he tried to plan what he would do. Mr Wentworth was obviously the most important one to get back, if he could. But he did need those running shoes too. I'll practice on the shoes, Charles muttered. If I get those, I'll try for Mr Wentworth. He stumbled off the end of the stairs and turned left towards the toilets. They were in a cross passage down at the end. Charles was halfway to the corner when the cross passage became full of dull, moving light. A half-lit figure loomed there, swinging a giant torch. The moving light caught the small white creature trundling at the figure's heels. The caretaker and his dog were on their way to inspect the toilets for vandals. Charles turned and tiptoed the other way. The passage promptly filled with a shrill yap like one very small clap of thunder. The dog had heard him. Charles ran. Behind him, he heard the caretaker shout, Who's there? and come clattering along the passage. Charles ran. He ran past the end of the stairs, hoping the caretaker would think he had gone up them again, and went on with his arms out in front of him until he met the swinging door beyond. Gently, he pushed the door open a small way. Softly, he slid around it, holding the edge of the door so that it would not thump shut and give him away. Then he stood there, hoping. It was no good. The caretaker was not fooled. A muzz of light grew in the glass of the door. The shadow of the stair rail swung across it and fell away, and the light went on, growing brighter as the caretaker advanced. Charles let the door go and ran again, thumping along dark corridors until he had no idea where he was and could hardly breathe. He shook off the caretaker, but he lost himself. Then he ran around a corner and blinked in the orange light from a far-off streetlight shining through a window. Beyond the window was the unmistakable door of the lower school boy's playroom. Even in that dim light, Charles knew the kick marks at the bottom of the door and the cracked glass in the upper panel where Nirupam Singh had tried to hit Dan Smith and missed. It seemed like home just then. There were worse places to practice magic in, Charles thought. He opened the door and crept in. In the faint light, someone else jumped around to face him. Charles jumped back against the door. He squeaked. The other person squeaked. Who are you? They both said at once. Then Charles found the light switch. He moved it down and then back up in one swift waggle, dazzling both of them. What he saw made him lean against the door, confounded, blinking green darkness. The other person was Brian Wentworth. That was odd enough. 
But the oddest thing in that dazzling moment of light was that Charles had clearly seen that Brian was in tears. Charles was amazed. Brian, as was well known, never cried. He shrieked and yowled and yelled for mercy when he was hit, but he had never, ever been known to shed tears. Charles went very quickly from amazement to horror, for it clearly took something out of the ordinary to make Brian cry, and that thing must be that Brian had discovered his father was mysteriously missing. I came down to make it all right again, Charles said guiltily. What can you do? said Brian's voice out of the dark, thick and throaty with crying. The only reason you're better off than me is because you glare at people and they leave you alone. I wish I had a dirty look like yours. Then I could stop them getting at me and hitting me all the time. He began crying again, loud, jerky sobs. Charles could hear the crying move off into the middle of the playroom, but he could not see Brian at first for the green dazzle. He really could not believe Brian minded being hit that much. It happened so often that Brian must be thoroughly used to it. By this time, he could see that Brian was crouching in the centre of the concrete floor. Charles went over and crouched down facing him. Is that the only thing that's the matter? He inquired cautiously. Only, said Brian, only thing? What else do you want them to do? Tear me apart limb from limb or something? Sometimes I wish they would. I'd be dead then. I wouldn't have to put up with them getting at me then, hour after hour, day after day. I hate this school. Yes, Charles said feelingly. So do I. It gave him wonderful pleasure to say it, but it did not help bring the subject around to the disappearance of Mr Wentworth. He took a deep breath to encourage himself. Er, uh, have you seen your father? Brian broke in almost with a scream. Of course I've been to my magicking father. I go to him nearly every day and ask him to let me leave this place. I went to him this afternoon and asked him. I said, why couldn't I go to Forest Road School like Stephen Towers does? And you know what he said? He said Forest Road was a private school and he couldn't afford it. Couldn't afford it, Brian said bitterly. I ask you. Why can't he afford it if Mr Towers can? He must get paid twice as much as Mr Towers. I bet he earns almost as much as Miss Cadwallader, and he says he can't afford it. Charles wondered. He remembered the threadbare hearthrug and the holes in Mr Wentworth's slippers. That looked like poverty to him. But he supposed it could be meanness. And that brought him back to his guilt. With Mr Wentworth gone, Brian would have to stay at Larwood House forever. But have you seen your father since then? he asked. No, said Brian. He told me not to keep coming whining to him. And he began to cry again. So Brian had not found out yet. Charles felt huge relief. There was still time to get Mr Wentworth back but that meant that it really was only being got at which was making Brian so unhappy. Despite the evidence, that surprised Charles. Brian always seemed so perky and unconcerned. Brian was talking again through his sobs. Whatever I do, he said, they get at me. I can't help my father being a teacher here. I can't help being good at things. I didn't ask Mr Brubeck to give me a solo to sing, he just did. But of course, magicking Simon Silverson thinks he ought to sing it. That's the thing I hate most, Brian said vehemently. The way everyone does what Simon Silverson says. I hate him too, said Charles, badly. Oh, it doesn't matter how we feel, Brian said. Simon's word is law. It's like that game, you know, Simon Says, where you have to do things if they say Simon Says first. And what is he, anyway? A stuck-up prat, said Charles, who sucks up to teachers, with golden hair and a saintly expression. 
Don't forget the smug look, said Brian. Who could, said Charles. He kicks you in the pants and then looks as if it's your fault his foot came up. He was enjoying this, but he stopped enjoying it when Brian said, Thanks for stopping them from hitting me this evening. What gave you the idea of burning your finger like that? And trust Simon Silverson to rip you off all your money just for a candle. Brian hesitated a second and then added, I suppose I'd better pay you half of it. Charles managed to stop himself backing away. That would be really unkind. But what was he to do now? Brian clearly thought Charles had come downstairs in order to comfort him. Probably he would expect Charles to be his friend in the future. Well, Charles supposed he had deserved it. This was what you got for putting the evil eye on people's fathers. But quite apart from Mr Wentworth, quite apart from the fact that Brian was lowest of the low in 6B, even quite apart from the fact that Charles did not like Brian, Charles knew he could not be friends with anyone now. He was a witch. He could get anyone who was friends with him arrested too. You mustn't pay me anything, he said. You don't owe me a thing. Brian seemed distinctly relieved. Then I'll tell you something instead, he said. I've had enough of this place. If my father won't take me away, I'm going to run away. Where to? said Charles. He had thought about running away himself a while back, but he had had to give up the idea because there was nowhere to run away to. No idea, said Brian. I shall just go. Don't be a fool, said Charles. This was one friendly thing he could say, at least. You have to plan it properly. If you just go, they'll call in tracker dogs and bring you straight back. Then you'll be punished. But I'll go mad if I stay here. Brian said hysterically. Then he appeared to stop and consider, with his teeth chattering. I think I see a way, he said. By this time, both of them were shivering. It was cold in the playroom. Charles wondered how he could make Brian go back to bed without going himself. He could not think of a way. So they both went on crouching face to face in the middle of the concrete floor, until there was a sudden little pattering outside the cracked door. Both of them jumped. Caretaker's dog, whispered Charles. Brian giggled. Stupid creature. It looks just like Teresa Mullet's knitting. Charles, before he could stop himself, gave a shriek of laughter. It does! It does! Shut up! hissed Brian. The caretaker's coming. Sure enough, the cracked glass of the door was showing misty torchlight. The dog began yapping furiously on the other side of it. It knew they were there. Brian and Charles sprang up and fled, through the playroom and out its other door. As it thumped shut behind them, the cracked door thumped open, and the hollow playroom echoed with the dog's little thunderclaps. Without a word, Charles ran one way, and Brian ran another. Where Brian went, Charles never knew. He heard the second door thump open as he ran, and the patter of tiny feet behind him. Charles held his glasses on and ran desperately. It was just like the seniors in the shrubbery. What made everyone chase him? Did he smell of witch or something? He found an outside door, but it was locked. He pelted on. Behind him in the distance, he could hear the caretaker bawling to his dog to come back. That made the dog hesitate. Charles, quite terrified by now, put on a spurt and hurled himself through the next door he came to. There was a feeling of large, cold space inside this door. Charles went forward a few cautious steps and hit his foot with a clang on a row of steel chairs. He stood frozen, waiting to be discovered. He could hardly hear for the blood banging in his ears at first. Then he found he could hear the dog yapping again, somewhere quite far off. It seemed to have lost him. At the same time, he found he could see the faint shapes of huge windows high up beyond the chairs. He was in the school hall. 
it came to Charles that he was not going to get a better opportunity than this. Better summon up his shoes at once. No, forget the shoes. Mr. Wentworth was far more urgent. Get Mr. Wentworth, and when Mr. Wentworth appeared, perhaps Charles could put in a word about Brian. It was at this point that Charles realised that he dared not fetch Mr. Wentworth back. If Mr. Wentworth did not know who had made him vanish, he would know as soon as he arrived back and found Charles. Flaming witches, Charles moaned. Why didn't I think? The dog, not too distant, gave another yap. Hunted and undecided, Charles shuffled forward and fell across more chairs. He was in a perfect maze of chairs. He stood where he was and tried to think. He could still get the shoes, he thought. He could say he was sleepwalking with worry about them when the caretaker found him. Uncertainly, he held up both arms. That dog was definitely coming nearer again. Shoes, Charles said hurriedly, and his voice cracked with fear and cold and lack of breath. Shoes, come to me. Hey, presto. Abracadabra. Shoes, I say. The dog sounded almost outside the hall door now. Charles made dragging movements with his hands and then crossed them over his chest. Shoes! A thing that by the sound could have been a shoe fell on the chair next to him. Despite the yapping dog, Charles grinned with pleasure. The second shoe fell on the other side of him. Charles put out groping hands to find them. And two more fell on his head. Several more flopped down near his feet. Now he could hear shoes dropping down all around him. He seemed to be in the centre of a rain of shoes, and the dog was scrabbling at the door now as it yapped. A Wellington boot by the feel hit Charles on the shoulder as he turned and groped along the chairs, stumbling over gym shoes, football boots and lace-ups, with more and more dropping around him as he groped. The caretaker was nearly at the door now. Charles could see the torchlight advancing through the glass. It helped him find his way. For he knew there was no question of any nonsense about sleepwalking now. He had to get out and fast. He floundered among the pattering, flopping shoes, between the rows of chairs to the side of the hall, where he bolted for the door that the teachers came in by. Pitch dark descended on the other side of that door. Charles supposed he was in the staff room, but he never knew for sure. Stumbling, with his hands held out in front of him, dreamlike with panic, he fell over a stool. As he picked himself up, he remembered his second witch, the one who came through the garden. He should have thought about her earlier, he realised, as he knocked into a pile of books. She said you couldn't work magic when you were frightened. She was right. Something had gone very wrong out there in the hall. Obviously, Charles thought, having a mad tangle with a coat of some kind, you needed to be cool and collected to be sure of getting it right. Oh, thank heaven, here was a door. Charles plunged out of the door and found himself not far from the main stairs. He fled up them. As he went, his thumb found the fat, painful blister on his finger and he rubbed it as he ran upward. What a waste! What an utter waste of money! Burning his finger seemed to have taught him nothing at all. And here was the beautiful, welcoming green nightlight of the dormitory corridors. Not far now. Charles did not remember getting into bed. His last clear thought was to wonder whether Brian had come back or whether he had run away on the spot. When the clanging bell dragged him awake in the morning, he had a sort of feeling that he had gone to sleep on the dormitory floor near the end of Brian's bed. But no, he was in his own bed. His glasses were hooked on the bed rail. He began to hope he had dreamed last night. But long before he was awake enough to sit up and yawn, the room filled with indignant voices. I can't find my shoes! I say, what's happened to all our shoes? My slippers aren't here either. 
As Charles managed to sit up, Simon said, Are you a shoe thief now, Brian? And smacked Brian's head in a jolly, careless way, to show he did not think Brian was capable of being anything so enterprising. Brian was kneeling up in bed, looking as sleepy as Charles felt. He did not answer Simon or look at Charles. In the next dormitory, they had no shoes either, and a senior could be heard coming down the corridor shouting, Hey, have you lot pinched our shoes? Everyone was annoyed. Everyone thought there was a practical joke going on. Charles just hoped they would go on thinking that. Everyone was forced to go without shoes and slither around in socks. Charles's shoes were missing too. He was glad he seemed to have been that thorough, and he was just dragging on a second pair of socks when rumour spread along the corridor. In the way of rumours, it was quite mysterious. Nobody knew who started it. We're to go down to the hall. All the shoes are there. Charles joined the slithering rush for the hall. That rush was joined in the downstairs passage by all the girls, also in socks, also making for the hall. The seniors naturally occupied the door of the hall. Everyone from the lower school streamed outside into the quadrangle to look through the hall windows. There, everyone's first reaction was simple awe. A school with 600 pupils owns an awful lot of shoes. There would be 1,200 even if everyone simply had one pair. But at Larwood House, everyone had to have special shoes for almost everything they did. So you had to add to that number all the gym shoes, running shoes, tennis shoes, trainers, dancing shoes, spare shoes, best shoes, sandals, football boots, hockey boots, Wellington boots and galoshes. The number of shoes is swiftly in thousands. Add to those all the shoes owned by the staff too. Miss Cadwallader's characteristic footgear with heels like cotton reels, the cook's extra wide fitting, the groundsman's hobnails, Mr Crossley's handmade suede, Mr Brubeck's brogues, the matron's sixteen pairs of stiletto heels, someone's purple fur boots and even the odd pair of riding boots, not to speak of many more. And you have truly formidable numbers. The chairs in the hall were buried under a monstrous mountain of shoes. Amid the general marvelling, Teresa's voice was heard. If this is someone's idea of a joke, I don't think it's funny. My bed socks are all muddy. She was wearing blue fluffy bed socks over her school socks. After this, there was something of a free-for-all. People scrambled in through doors and windows and slithered on the pile of shoes, digging for shoes they thought were theirs, or, failing that, simply a pair that would fit. Until a voice began bellowing, Out! Get out, all of you! Leave all the shoes there! Charles was pushed backwards by the rather slower rush to leave the hall and had to crane to see who was shouting. It was Mr. Wentworth. Charles was so amazed that he stopped moving and was left by a sort of eddy inside the hall just by the door. From there, he could clearly see Mr. Wentworth walking down the edge of the pile of shoes. He was wearing his usual shabby suit, but his feet were completely bare. Otherwise, there was nothing wrong with him at all. After him came Mr Crossley in bright yellow socks and Mr Brubeck with a large hole in the heel of his left sock. After them came the caretaker. After him, of course, trundled the caretaker's dog, which was manifestly wishing to raise a leg against the pile of shoes. I don't know who done it, the caretaker was protesting, but I know there was people sneaking around my building after night. The dog nearly caught one right in this very hall. Did you come in here and investigate? Mr Wentworth said. Door was shut, said the caretaker. Thought it was locked. Mr Wentworth turned from him in disgust. Someone was pretty busy in here all last night, 
he said to Mr. Crossley, and he didn't even look. Thought it was locked, repeated the caretaker. Oh, shut up, snapped Mr. Wentworth, and stop your dog peeing on that shoe. It's Miss Cadwallader's. Charles slipped out into the corridor, trying to keep the grin on his face down to decent proportions. Mr. Wentworth was all right. He must have slipped off to bed after all last night while Miss Hodge was asking Charles the way. And better still, everyone thought the shoes had arrived in the hall quite naturally. Charles could have danced and sung. But here was Dan Smith beside him. That sobered Charles somewhat. Hey, said Dan, did those seniors catch you last night? No, I ran away. Charles replied airily. You must have run pretty fast, said Dan. It was grudging, but it was praise coming from Dan. Know anything about who did these shoes? Dan asked, jerking his head toward the hall. Charles would dearly have loved to say it was him and watched the respect grow on Dan's face, but he was not that much of a fool. No, he said. I do, said Dan. It was the witch in our class, I bet. Mr Wentworth appeared in the doorway of the hall. There were loud shushings up and down the packed corridor. Breakfast is going to be late, Mr Wentworth shouted. He looked very harrowed. You can't expect the kitchen staff to work without shoes. You are all to go to your classrooms and wait there. Meanwhile, teachers and sixth graders are going to be working hard laying all the shoes out in the main quadrangle. When you are called, when you are called, understand, you are to come by classes and pick out the shoes which are yours. Off you all go. Sixth grade, stay behind. Everyone milled off in a reluctant crowd. Charles was so pleased with himself that he risked grinning at Brian. But Brian was staring dreamily at the wall and did not notice. He did not move or even yell when Simon slapped him absent-mindedly around the head. "'Where's Nan Pilgrim?' Simon asked, laughing. "'Turned herself invisible?' Nan was keeping out of the way, lurking in the top corridor by the girls' bathrooms. From there, she had an excellent view of the quadrangle being covered with row upon row of shoes, and the kitchen ladies tiptoeing about the rows in stockings looking for their work shoes. It did not amuse her. Teresa's friend, Delia Martin, and Estelle's friend, Karen Grigg, had already made it quite plain that they thought it was Nan's doing. The fact that these two normally did not speak to one another, or to Nan either, only seemed to make it worse. Evan Breakfast was ready before 6B had been called to find their shoes. Teresa was forced to walk through the corridors in her blue bed socks. They were by this time quite black underneath, which upset her considerably. Breakfast was so late that assembly was cancelled. Instead, Miss Cadwallader stood up in front of high table with her face all stringy with displeasure and one foot noticeably damp, and made a short speech. A singularly silly trick has been played on the school, she said. The people who played it no doubt think it's very funny, but they must be able to see by now what a stupid and dishonourable thing they have done. I want them to be honourable now. I want them to come to me and confess, and I want anyone else who knows or suspects who did it to be equally honourable and come and tell me what they know. I shall be in my study all morning. That is all. What is honourable? Nirupam said loudly as everyone stood up, about going and telling tales. By saying that, he did Nan a service whether he meant to or not. No one in 6B wanted a name for telling tales. Nobody went to Miss Cadwallader. Instead, they all went out into the quadrangle, where a little freezing drizzle of rain was now falling, and walked up and down the rows of damp footgear, finding their shoes. Nan was forced to go, too. Oh, look! Here comes Archwitch Dulcinea, said Simon. 
Why did you do it to your own shoes too, Dulcinea? Thought it would look more innocent, did you? And Teresa said, Really, Nan, my bed socks are ruined. It isn't funny. Do something really funny now, Nan, Karen Grigg suggested. Hurry up, Mr Crossley shouted from the shelter of the porch. Everyone at once became very busy turning over shoes. The only one who did not was Brian. He simply wandered about, staring into space. In the end, Nirupam found his shoes for him and bundled them into Brian's lax arms. Are you all right? Nirupam asked him. Who, me? Oh, yes, Brian said. Are you sure? One of your eyes is sort of set sideways, Nirupam said. Is it? Brian asked vaguely and wandered off. Nirupam turned severely to Simon. I think you hit him on the head once too often. Simon laughed a little uneasily. Nirupam was a head taller than he was. Nonsense! There's nothing in his head to get hurt. Well, you watch it, said Nirupam, and might have said more, except that they were interrupted by an annoyed outcry from Dan Smith. I'll get someone for this, Dan was shouting. He was very pale and cross after last night's midnight feast, and he looked quite savage. I'll get them even if they're a magicking senior. Someone's gone off with my running shoes. I can't find them anywhere. Look again carefully, Mr Crossley bawled from the porch. This was a queer fact. Dan searched up and down the rows, and so did Charles, until their socks were soaked and their hair was trickling rain. But neither Dan's spikes nor Charles's were there. By this time, 7A, 7B and 7C had been allowed out to collect their shoes too, before they all got too wet, and almost the only footgear left was the three-odd football boots, the riding boots and a pair of luminous green trainers that nobody seemed to want. Dan uttered such threats that Charles was glad that it did not seem to occur to Dan that this had anything to do with Charles Morgan. But it meant that Charles had to go to Mr Towers next and confess that his running shoes had still not turned up. He was fed up as he stood and trickled rain outside the staff room. After all his trouble! I did look, sir, he assured Mr Towers. Mr. Towers glanced at Charles's soaking hair and rain-dewed glasses. Anyone can stand in the rain, he said. Are you paying for new ones or writing lines? Doing lines, Charles said resentfully. In detention every evening until Christmas, then, Mr. Towers said. The idea seemed to please him. Wait. He dodged back into the staff room and came out again with a fat old book. Here, he said, handing the book to Charles. Copy 500 lines of this out every evening. It will show you what a real schoolboy should be like. When you've copied it all, I'll give you the sequel. Charles stood in front of the staff room and looked at the book. It was called The Pluckiest Boy in School. It smelled of mildew. Inside, the pages were furry and brownish, and the first line of the story went, What ripping fun! exclaimed Watts Minor. I'm down for scrum half this afternoon. Charles looked from this to the fat, transparent and useless blister on his finger and felt rather ill. Magicking hell, he said. Good morning, Charles, said Miss Hodge, tripping towards the staff room all fresh and unaware. That looks like a nice old book. I'm glad to see you doing some serious reading at last. She was most disconcerted to receive one of Charles's heaviest double-barrelled glares. What a moody boy he was, to be sure, she thought, as she neatly stripped off her raincoat. She was equally surprised to find the staff room in some kind of uproar, with a pile of boots and shoes in the middle. Still, there was Mr. Wentworth at last, flying past on his way somewhere else. Miss Hodge stood in his way. 
Oh, Mr. Wentworth, I want to apologise for making that accusation against Charles Morgan. That was pretty generous of her, she thought, after the way Charles had just looked at her. She smiled generously at Mr. Wentworth. To her annoyance, Mr. Wentworth simply said, I'm glad to hear it, and brushed past her quite rudely. But he did have a lot on his mind, Miss Hodge realised, when Mr. Crossley told her excitedly all about the shoes. She did not hold it against Mr. Wentworth. She collected books. They had gotten spilled all over the floor somehow, and went off to give 6B another English lesson. She arrived to find Simon Silverson holding aloft the pluckiest boy in school. Listen to this, he was saying. Swelling with pride, Watts Minor gazed into the eyes of his one true friend. Here was a boy above all, straight alike in body and mind. Teresa and Delia were screaming with laughter, with their faces buried in their knitting. Charles was glaring blue murder. Really, Simon, said Miss Hodge, that was unworthy of you. Simon looked at her in astonishment. He knew he never did anything unworthy. But Charles, said Miss Hodge, I do think you made rather an unfortunate choice of book. For the second time that day, Charles turned his glare on her. Miss Hodge flinched. Really? If she had not known now that Charles was a nice boy underneath, that glare of his would make her think seriously of the evil eye. Niropam held up his long arm. Are we going to do acting again? he asked hopefully. No, we are not, Miss Hodge said with great firmness. Get out your poetry books. The lesson and the rest of the morning dragged past. Teresa finished her second bootie and cast on stitches for a sweater. Estelle knitted quite a lot of a baby's bonnet. Brian gave up staring at the wall and instead seemed to be attacked by violent industry. Whenever anyone looked at him, he was scribbling furiously in a different exercise book. Charles sat and brooded, rather surprised at the things going on in his mind. He was not frightened at all now. He seemed to be accepting the fact he was a witch quite calmly after all. No one had noticed. They all thought the witch was Nan Pilgrim because of her name, which suited Charles very well. But the really strange thing was the way he had stopped being worried by the witch he had seen being burned. He tried remembering him, cautiously at first, then boldly when he found it did not bother him. Then he went on to the second witch who came over the wall. Neither troubled him now. They were in the past. They were gone. It was like having a toothache that suddenly stops. In the peace that came with this, Charles saw that his mind must have been trying to tell him he was going to grow up a witch. And now that he knew, it stopped nagging him. Then, to see if this made him frightened, he thought of inquisitors. It hurts to be burned, he thought, and looked at his fat blister. It had taught him something after all, and that was, don't get found out. Good, thought Charles, and turned his mind to what he was going to do to Simon Silverson. Dan Smith next, but Simon definitely first. What could he do to Simon that would be worth nearly a whole term's pocket money? It was difficult. It had to be something bad enough, and yet with no connection with Charles. Charles was quite stumped at first. He wanted it to be artistic. He wanted Simon to suffer. He wanted everyone else to know about it, but not to know it was Charles who did it. What could he do? The last lesson before lunch was the daily P.E., Today it was the boys' turn in the gym. They were to climb ropes too. Charles sat by the wall bars and pretended to tie his gym shoe. 
Unlike Nan, he could get up a rope if he wanted, but he did not want to. He wanted to sit and think what to do to Simon. Simon, of course, was one of the first to the ceiling. He saw Charles and shouted something down. The result was that someone from 6C came and dug Charles in the back. Simon says you're to stop lazing about. Simon says that, does he? said Charles. He stood up. He was inspired. It was something Brian had said last night. That game, Simon says. Suppose it was not just a game. Suppose everything Simon said really came true. At the very worst, it ought to be pretty funny. At best, people might even think Simon was a witch. Charles went up a rope. He dragged himself up it, nice and slow and gentle, so that he could go on thinking. He was obviously not going to be able to stand anywhere near Simon to put the spell on him. Someone would notice. But instinct told Charles that this was not the kind of magic you could work at a distance. It was too strong and personal. What he needed in order to do it safely was something which was not Simon himself, but something which belonged to Simon so personally that any witchcraft worked on it would work on Simon at the same time. A detachable piece of Simon, really. What removable parts had Simon? Teeth, toenails, fingernails, hair? He could hardly go up to Simon and pull any of those off him. Wait a minute! Hair! Simon combed his hair this morning. With any luck, there might be some hair stuck in Simon's comb. Charles slid jubilantly down the rope, so fast that he was reminded again that it hurt to be burned. He had to blow on his hands to cool them. After lunch was the time. He could sneak up to the dormitory then. After lunch proved to be important for Nan, too. At lunch, she managed to escape Karen Grigg and Delia Martin by sitting at a table full of much older girls who did not seem to know Nan was there. They towered over her, talking of their own things. The food was almost as bad as yesterday, but Nan felt no urge to describe it. She rather wished she was dead. Then it occurred to her that if any of 6B went and told a teacher she was a witch, she would be dead quite soon after that. She realised at once that she did not wish she was dead. That made her feel better. No one had gone to a teacher yet, after all. It's only their usual silliness, she told herself. They'll forget about it by Christmas. I'll just have to keep out of their way till they do. Accordingly, after lunch, Nan sneaked upstairs to lurk in the passage outside the girls' bathrooms again. But Karen Grigg had been keeping tabs on her. She and Teresa appeared in the passage in front of Nan. When Nan turned around to make off, she found Delia and the other girls coming along the passage from the other end. Let's go in this bathroom, Teresa suggested. We want to ask you something, Nan. Nan could tell there was an ordeal coming. For a moment, she wondered whether to charge Teresa and Karen like a bull and burst past them, but they would only catch her tonight in the dormitory. Best get it over. OK, she said, and sauntered into the bathroom as if she did not care. Almost at the same moment, Charles hastened furtively into the boys' dormitory. White and clean and cold, the bed stood like rows of deserted icebergs, each with its little white locker at its side. Charles hurried to Simon's. It was locked. Simon was an inveterate locker of things. Even his watch had a little key to lock it on his wrist. But Charles did not let that bother him. He held out his hand imperiously in front of the locked door. Comb! he said, abracadabra. Simon's comb came gliding out through the white wooden surface like a fish swimming out of milk and darted fish-like into Charles's hand. It was 
beautiful. Better still, there were three of Simon's curly golden hairs clinging to the teeth of the comb. Charles carefully pulled them off. He held the hairs in the finger and thumb of his left hand and carefully ran his right finger and thumb down the length of them. And down again. Over and over he did it. Simon says, he whispered to them. Simon says, Simon says, whatever Simon says is true. After about a minute, when he had done it often enough to give him the feeling that the spell was going to take, Charles carefully threaded the hairs back into the comb again. He did not intend to leave any evidence against himself. He had just finished when Brian said from behind him, I want a bit of help from you, Charles. Charles jumped as if Brian had shot him. He bent over in white horror to hide the comb in his hand and with terrible guilty haste gave it a push toward the locker. It went in, to his surprise, not quite like a fish this time, more like a comb being pushed through a door, but at least it went. What do you want? Charles said ungraciously to Brian. Take me down to the matron in the sick bay, Brian said. It was a school rule that a person who felt ill had to find another person to take them to the matron. It had been made because before that the sick bay had been crowded with healthy people trying to get an afternoon off. The idea was that you could not deceive your friends. It did not work very well. Estelle Green, for instance, got Karen to take her to the matron at least twice a week. As far as Charles could see, Brian looked his usual pink and perky self, just like Estelle. You don't look ill to me, he said. He wanted to find Simon and see if the spell was working. How about this then, said Brian. To Charles's surprise, he suddenly turned pale. He stared vaguely at the wall, with one eye pointing inward slightly. This is it, Brian said. Don't I look rather as if I'd been hypnotised? You look as if you'd been hit on the head, Charles said rudely. Get nearer, Pam, to take you. He looked after me this morning, said Brian. I want as many witnesses as possible. I helped you last night. You help me now. You didn't help me last night said Charles. Yes, I did, said Brian. You came in and you went to sleep on the floor just at the end of my bed. I got you in your bed. I even hooked your glasses on your bed rail for you. And he looked at Charles very meaningfully. Charles stared back. Brian was so thin and small that it was hard to believe he could lift anyone into bed. But whether it was true or not, Charles realised that Brian had gotten him over a barrel. He knew Charles had been up last night. He had caught him with Simon's comb in his hands just now. Charles could not see why Brian wanted to go to the matron, but that was his own affair. All right, he said, I'll take you. Inside the bathroom on the other side of the quadrangle, the girls crowded in around Nan. Where's Estelle? asked Teresa. Outside keeping watch, said Karen. That's all she would do. What's this about? Nan asked aggressively. We want you to do some proper witchcraft, said Teresa. Here, where we can see you. We've none of us seen any before, and we know you can. Come on, we won't give you away. The other girls joined in. Come on, Nan, we won't tell. The bathroom was a very public one. There were six baths in it in a row. As the girls all crowded forward, Nan backed away down the space between two of the baths. This was evidently just what they had wanted. Delia said, That's it. Heather said, Fetch it out. And Karen bent and pulled the groundsman's old broom out from under the left-hand bath. Julia and Deborah seized it and propped it across the two baths in front of Nan, penning her in. Nan looked from it to them. We want you to get on it and fly about, Teresa explained. 
Everyone knows that's what witches do, said Karen. We're asking you very nicely, said Teresa. Typical Teresa double think, Nan thought angrily. She was not asking her nicely. It was a smiling jeer. But if anyone asked Teresa afterward, she would say with honest innocence that she had been perfectly kind. We can prove you're a witch anyway, if you won't, Teresa said kindly. Yes, everyone knows that witches don't drown, said Delia. You can put them right under water and they stay alive. At this cue, Karen leaned over and put the plug in the nearest bath. Heather turned on the cold tap, just a little trickle, to show Nan they meant business. You know perfectly well, Nan said, that I'm not a witch and I can't fly on this broomstick. It's just an excuse to be nasty. Nasty? said Teresa. Who's being nasty? We're asking you quite politely to ride the broomstick. Behind her, the tap trickled steadily into the bath. You can fetch all the shoes here again if you like, Delia said. We don't mind which. But you've got to do something, said Karen. Or how would you like a nice, deep, cold bath with all your clothes on? Nan was annoyed enough by that to put one leg over the broomstick in order to climb out and get at Karen. Seeing it, Teresa gave a delighted jump and a giggle. Oh, she's going to ride! The rest of them joined in. She's going to ride it! Ride it, Nan! Very red in the face, Nan stood astride the broom and explained, I'm not going to ride. I do not know how to ride. You know I can't. I know I can't. Look, look at me. I'm sitting on the broomstick. Unwisely, she sat. It was extremely uncomfortable, and she was forced to bounce upright again. This amused everyone highly. Angrier than ever, Nan shouted, How can I ride a broomstick? I can't even climb a rope! They knew that. They were falling about laughing when Estelle burst in, screaming with excitement. Come and look! Come and look! Look at what Simon Silverson's doing! This caused a stampede to the door to look out of the windows in the corridor. Nan heard cries of, Good heavens! Just look at that! This was followed by a further stampede as everyone raced off down to the quadrangle. Nan was left astride an old broom propped on two baths. Thank goodness! was the first thing she said. She had been precious near crying. Stupid hussies! she said next. As if I could ride this thing! Look at it! She jogged the broom. Just an old broom. Then she noticed the water still trickling into the bath behind her. She leaned sideways and back and turned off the tap. That was the moment the old broom chose to rise sharply to the ceiling. Nan shrieked. She was suddenly dangling head down over a bath of cold water. The broom staggered a bit under her weight, but it went on climbing, swinging Nan right over the water. Nan bent her leg as hard as she could over its knobby stick and managed to clench one hand in its sparse brushwood end. The broom reached the ceiling and levelled out. It did not leave room for Nan to climb on top of it, even if she had possessed the muscles. Blood thudded in her head from hanging upside down, but she did not dare let go. Stop it! She squealed to the broom, please! It took no notice. It simply went on a solemn, lopsided, bumping flight all around the bathroom, with Nan dangling desperately underneath it and getting this way and that glimpses of hard white baths frighteningly far below. I'm glad this didn't happen while the others were here, she gasped. I must look a right idiot. She began to laugh. She must look so silly. Do go down, she said to the broom. Suppose someone else comes in here. The broom seemed struck by this. 
It gave a little start and slanted steeply down towards the floor. As soon as the floor was near enough, Nan clutched the handle in both hands and tried to unhook her leg. A mistake. The broom went steeply up again and hovered where it was just too high for Nan to dare to fall off. But her arms were getting tired and she had to do something. Wriggling and squirming, she managed to kick herself over until she was more or less lying along the knobby handle, looking down at the row of baths. She hooked her feet on the brush and stayed there, panting. Now what was she to do? This broom seemed determined to be ridden. There was a sad feeling about it. Once, long ago, it had been ridden, and it missed its witch. But that's all very well, Nan said to it. I really daren't ride you now. Don't you understand? It's illegal. Suppose I promise to ride you tonight. Would you let me down then? There was a hesitating sort of hover to the broom. I swear to, said Nan. Listen, I tell you what. You fly me down the passage to our dormitory. That will make a bit of a flight at least. Then you can hide yourself on top of the cupboard right at the back. No one will see you there. And I'll promise to take you out tonight. What do you say? Though the broom could not speak, it evidently meant yes. It turned and swept through the bathroom doorway in a glad swoop that made Nan seasick. It sped down the passage. She had to shut her eyes in order not to see the walls whirling by. It made a hair-raising turn into the dormitory, and it stopped there with such a jerk that Nan nearly fell around underneath it again. I see I shall have to train you, she gasped. The broom gave an indignant buck and a bounce. I mean, you'll have to train me, Nan said quickly. Go down now, I have to get off you. The broom hovered, questioning. I promised, Nan said. At that, the broom came sweetly to the ground and Nan was able to get off very wobbly in the legs. As soon as she was off, the broom fell to the floor, lifeless. You poor thing, Nan said. I see. You need a rider to move at all. All right, let's get you on top of the cupboard. In this way, she missed the first manifestation of the Simon Says spell. Charles missed it too. Neither of them discovered how Simon first found out that everything he said came true. Charles left Brian with a thermometer in his mouth, staring cross-eyed at the wall, and trudged back to the quadrangle to find an excited group around Simon. At first, Charles thought that the brightness flaring at Simon's feet was simply the sun shining off a puddle. But it was not. It was a heap of gold coins. People were passing him pennies and stones and dead leaves. To each thing as he took it, Simon said, This is a gold coin. This is another gold coin. When that got boring, he said, This is a rare gold coin. These are pieces of eight. This is a doubloon. Charles shoved his way to the front of the crowd and watched utterly disgusted. Trust Simon to turn things to his own advantage. Gold chinked down on the heap. Simon must have been a millionaire by this time. With a great clatter of running feet, the girls arrived. Teresa, with a knitting bag hanging on her arm, pushed her way to the front beside Charles. She was so astonished at the size of the pile of gold that she crossed the invisible line and spoke to Simon. How are you doing it, Simon? Simon laughed. He was like a drunk person by this time. I've got the golden touch, he said. Of course, this immediately became the truth. Just like that king in the story, look! He reached for Teresa's knitting. 
Teresa indignantly snatched the knitting away and gave Simon a push at the same time. The result was that Simon touched her hand. The knitting fell on the ground. Teresa screamed and stood holding her hand out and then screamed again because her hand was too heavy to hold up. It dropped down against her skirt, a bright golden metal hand on the end of an ordinary human arm. Out of the shocked silence which followed, Nirupam said, Be very careful what you say, Simon. Why? said Simon. Because everything you say becomes true, Nirupam said. Evidently, Simon had not quite seen the extent of his powers. You mean, he said, I haven't got the golden touch. Instantly, he hadn't. Let's test this, he said. He bent down and picked up Teresa's knitting. It was still knitting, in a slightly muddy bag. Put it down, Teresa said faintly. I shall go to Miss Cadwallader. No, you won't, said Simon. And that was true too. He looked at the knitting and considered. This knitting, he announced, is really... Two little caretakers' dogs. The bag began to writhe about in his hands. Simon hurriedly dropped it with a sharp chink onto the heap of gold. The bag heaved. Little shrill yappings came from inside it and furious scrabbling. One little white booty dog burst out of it, shortly followed by a second. They ran on little minute legs down the heap of gold and in among people's legs. Everyone got rather quickly out of their way. Everyone turned and watched as the two tiny white dogs went running and running into the distance across the quadrangle. Teresa started to cry. That was my knitting, you beast! So, Simon said, laughing. Teresa lifted up her golden hand with her ordinary one and hit him with it. It was stupid of her because she risked breaking her arm, but it was certainly effective. It nearly knocked Simon out. He sat down heavily on his heap of gold. Ow, said Teresa, and I hope that hurt. It didn't, said Simon, and got up smiling, and of course unhurt. Teresa went for him again, double-handed. Simon skipped aside. You haven't got one golden hand, he said. There was suddenly space where Teresa's heavy golden hand had been. Her arm ended in a round pink wrist. Teresa stared at it. How shall I knit, she said. I mean, Simon said carefully, that you have two ordinary hands. Teresa looked at her two perfectly ordinary human hands and burst into strange, artificial-sounding laughter. Somebody kill him for me, she said. Quickly! Nobody offered to. Everybody was too shattered. Delia took Teresa's arm and led her tenderly away. The bell rang for afternoon lessons as they went. This is marvellous fun, Simon said. From now on, I'm all in favour of witchcraft. Charles trudged off to lessons, wondering how he could cancel the spell. Simon arrived late for lessons. He had been making sure his heap of gold was safe. I'm sorry, sir, he said to Mr. Crossley. And sorry he was. Tears came into his eyes, he was so sorry. That's all right, Simon, Mr. Crossley said kindly. And everyone else felt compelled to look at Simon with deep sympathy. You can't win with people like Simon, Charles thought bitterly. Anyone else would have been in bad trouble by now. 
and it was exasperating the way nobody so much as dreamed of accusing Simon of witchcraft. They kept looking at Nan Pilgrim instead. Nan felt much the same about Teresa. Teresa arrived ten minutes after Simon, very white and sniffing, rather. She was led in tenderly by Delia, and received almost as much sympathy as Simon. Just gave her an aspirin and sent her away, Nan heard Delia whisper indignantly to Karen. I do think she ought to have been allowed to lie down after all she's been through. What about all I've been through? Nan thought. No, it was Teresa's right to be in the right, as much as it was Simon's. Nan had been given the full story by Estelle. Estelle was always ready to talk in class, and she was particularly ready now that Karen seemed to have joined Teresa's friends. She knitted away under her desk at her baby's bonnet and whispered and whispered. Nor was she the only one. Mr. Crossley kept calling for quiet, but the whispers and rustling hardly abated at all. Notes kept arriving on Nan's desk. The first to arrive was from Dan Smith. Make me the same as Simon and I'll be your friend forever, it said. Most of the other notes said the same. All were very respectful. But one note was different. This one said... Meet me around the back after lessons. I think you need help and I can advise you. It was not signed. Nan wondered about it. She had seen the writing before, but she did not know whose it was. She supposed she did need help. She really was a witch now. No one but a witch could fly a broomstick. She knew she was in danger and she knew she should be terrified. But she was not. She felt happy and strong, with a happiness and strength that seemed to be welling up from deep inside her. She kept remembering the way she had started to laugh when the broomstick went flying round the bathroom, with herself dangling underneath it, and the way she seemed to understand by instinct what the broom wanted. Hair-raising as it had been, she had enjoyed it thoroughly. It was like coming into her birthright. Of course, Simon always said you were a witch, Estelle whispered. That reduced Nan's joy a little. There was another witch in 6B, she did not doubt that. And that witch had, for some mad reason, made everything Simon said come true. He must be one of Simon's friends and it was quite possible that Simon, while he was under the spell, had happened to say that Nan was a witch. So, of course, she would have become one. Nan refused to believe it. She was a witch. She wanted to be one. She came from a long line of witches, stretching back beyond even Dulcinea Wilkes herself. She felt she had a right to be a witch. All this while... Mr. Crossley was trying to give 6B a geography lesson. He had gotten to the point where he was precious near giving up and giving everyone detention instead. He had one last try. He could see that the unrest was centering on Simon, with a sub-centre around Nan, so he tried to make use of it by asking Simon questions. Now, the geography of Finland is very much affected by the last ice age. Simon... What happens in an ice age? Simon dragged his mind away from dreams of gold and glory. Everything is very cold, he said. A blast of cold air swept through the room, making everyone's teeth chatter. And goes on getting colder, I suppose, Simon added unwisely. The air in the room swiftly became icy. 6B's breath rolled out in steam. The windows misted over and froze almost at once into frosty patterns. Icicles began to grow under the radiators. Frost whitened the desks. There was a chorus of shivers and groans, and Niropam hissed, Watch it! I mean, everything gets very hot, Simon said hastily. Before Mr Crossley had time to wonder why he was shivering, the cold was replaced by tropical heat. 
The frost slid away down the windows. The icicles tinkled off the radiators. For an instant, the room seemed fine and warm, until the frozen water evaporated. This produced a thick, steamy fog. In the murk, people were gasping. Some faces turned red, others white, and sweat ran on foreheads, adding to the fog. Mr. Crossley put a hand to his forehead, thinking he might be getting the flu. The room seemed so dim suddenly. Some theories do say that an ice age starts with extreme heat, he said uncertainly. But I say everything is normal for this time of year, Simon said, desperately trying to adjust the temperature. Instantly, it was. The classroom reverted to its usual way of being not quite warm enough, though still a little damp. Mr. Crossley found he felt better. Stop talking nonsense, Simon, he said angrily. Simon, with incredulity, realised that he might get into trouble. He tried to pass the whole thing off in his usual lordly way. Well, sir, nobody really knows a thing about ice ages, do they? We'll see about that, Mr. Crossley said grimly. And of course, nobody did. When he came to ask Estelle to describe an ice age, Mr. Crossley found himself wondering just why he was asking about something which did not exist. No wonder Estelle looked so blank. He rounded back on Simon. Is this a joke of some kind? What are you thinking of? Me? I'm not thinking of anything, Simon said defensively, with disastrous results. Ah, this is more like it, Charles thought, watching the look of complete vacancy growing on Simon's face. Teresa saw Simon's eyes glaze and his jaw drop and jumped to her feet with a scream. Stop him, she screamed. Kill him. Do something to him before he says another word. Sit down, Teresa, said Mr. Crossley. Teresa stayed standing up. You wouldn't believe what he's done already, she shouted. And now look at him. If he says a word in that state... Mr. Crossley looked at Simon. The boy seemed to be pretending to be an idiot now. What was the matter with everyone? Take that look off your face, Simon, he said. You're not that much of a fool. Simon was now in a state of perfect blankness. And in that state, people have a way of picking up and echoing anything that is said to them. Not that much of a fool, he said slurrily. The vacancy of his face was joined by a look of deep cunning. Perhaps that was just as well, Charles thought. There was no doubt that Teresa had a point. Don't speak to him, Teresa shouted. Don't you understand? It's every word he says, and... She swung around and pointed at Nan. It's all her fault. Before lunch... Nan would have quailed in front of Teresa's pointing finger, and everyone's eyes turned on her. But she had ridden a broomstick now, and things were different. She was able to look scornfully at Teresa. What nonsense, she said. Mr. Crossley was forced to agree that Nan was right. Don't be ridiculous, Teresa, he said. I told you to sit down. And he relieved his feelings by giving both Teresa and Simon an hour in detention. Detention! Teresa exclaimed and sat down with a bump. She was outraged. Simon, however, uttered a cunning chuckle. You think you've got me, don't you? He said. Yes, I do, said Mr. Crossley. Make it an hour and a half. Simon opened his mouth to say something else. But here Nirupam intervened. He leaned over and whispered to Simon, You're very clever. Clever people keep their mouths shut. Simon nodded slowly with immense, stupid wisdom. And to Charles's disappointment, he seemed to take Nirupam's advice. Get your journals out, Mr. Crossley said wearily. 
There should be some peace now, at least, he thought. People opened their journals. They spread today's page in front of them. They picked up pens. And at that point, even those who had not realised already saw that there was almost nothing they dared write down. It was most frustrating. Here they were, with real, interesting events going on for once and plenty of things to say, and almost none of it was fit for Miss Cadwallader's eyes. People chewed pens, shifted, scratched their heads and stared at the ceiling. The most pitiable ones were those who were planning to ask Nan to endow them with the golden touch or instant fame or some other good thing. If they described any of the magic Nan was thought to have done, she would be arrested for witchcraft and they would have killed the goose that laid the golden eggs. Nan Pilgrim is not really a witch, Dan Smith wrote, after much hard thinking. He had rather a stomachache after last night's midnight feast and it made his mind go slow. I never thought she was, really. It was just Mr Crossley having a joke. There was a practical joke this morning. It must have been hard work pinching everyone's shoes like that, and then someone pinched my spikes and got me really mad. The caretaker's dog peed... And there Dan stopped, remembering Miss Cadwallader would read this too. Got quite carried away there, he thought. No comment again today, Nirapam wrote swiftly. Someone is riding for a fall. Not that I blame them for this afternoon, but the shoes were silly. He put down his pen and went to sleep. He had been up half the night eating buns from under the floorboards. My bed socks were ruined, Teresa complained in her angel writing. My knitting was destroyed. Today has been awful. I do not want to tell tales, and I know Simon Silverson is not in his right mind, but someone should do something. Teddy Crossley is useless and unfair, and Estelle Green always thinks she knows best, but she can't keep her knitting clean. The matron was unfair too. She sent me away with an aspirin, and she let Brian Wentworth lie down, and I was really ill. I shall never speak to Nan Pilgrim again. Most people though they could not attain Teresa's eloquence, managed to write something in the end. But three people still sat staring at blank paper. These were Simon, Charles and Nan. Simon was very cunning. He was clever. He was thoroughly suspicious of the whole thing. They were trying to catch him out somehow. The safest and cleverest thing was not to commit anything to writing. He was sure of that. On the other hand, it would not do to let everyone know how clever he had gone. It would look peculiar. He ought to write just one thing. So after more than half an hour of deep thought, he wrote, Doggies. It took him five minutes. Then he sat back, confident that he had fooled everyone. Charles was stumped because he simply had no code for most of the things which had happened. He knew he had to write something, but the more he tried to think, the more difficult it seemed. At one point he almost went to sleep like Nirupam. He pulled himself together. Think. Well, he could not write, I got up, for a start, because he had almost enjoyed today. Nor could he write, I didn't get up, because that made no sense. But he had better mention the shoes, because everyone else would. And he could talk about Simon under the coat of potatoes. Mr Towers could get a mention too. It was nearly time for the bell before Charles sorted all this out. Hastily he scrawled, Our shoes all went to play games. I thought about potatoes having hair hanging on a rope. I have games with a bad book. As Mr Crossley told them to put away their journals, Charles thought of something else and dashed it down. I shall never be hot again. Nan wrote nothing at all. She sat smiling at her empty page, feeling no need to describe anything. When the bell went as a gesture, she wrote down the date 
October 30th. Then she shut her journal. The instant Mr. Crossley left the room, Nan was surrounded. You got my note? People clamoured at her. Can you make it that whenever I touch a penny it turns to gold? Just pennies? Can you make my hair go like Teresa's? Can you give me three wishes every time I say buttons? I want big muscles like Dan Smith. Can you get us ice cream for supper? I need good luck for the rest of my life. Nan looked over at where Simon sat, hunched up with cunning and darting shrewd, stupid looks at Nirupam, who was sitting watchfully over him. If it was Simon who was responsible, there was no knowing when he would say something to cancel her witchcraft. Nan refused to believe it was Simon, but it was silly to make rash promises, whatever had made her a witch. There isn't time to work magic now, she told the clamouring crowd. And when that brought a volley of appeals and groans, she shouted, It takes hours, don't you understand? You don't only have to mutter spells and brew potions. You have got to go out and pick strange herbs and say stranger incantations at dawn and full moon before you can even begin. And when you've done all that, it doesn't necessarily work right away. Most of the time you have to fly around and around the smoking herbs all night, chanting sounds of unutterable sweetness before anything happens at all. Now do you see? Utter silence greeted this piece of invention. Much encouraged, Nan added, Besides, what have any of you done to deserve me going to all that trouble? What indeed? Mr. Wentworth asked from behind her. What exactly is going on here? Nan spun around. Mr. Wentworth was right in the middle of the room and had probably heard every word. Around her, everyone was slinking back to their seats. That was my speech for the school concert, sir, she said. Do you think it's any good? It has possibilities, said Mr. Wentworth, but it will need a little more working up to be quite good enough. Math books out, please. Nan sank down into her seat, weak with relief. For one awful moment she had thought Mr Wentworth might have her arrested. I said math books out, Simon, Mr Wentworth said. Why are you giving me that awful cunning look? Is it such a peculiar thing to ask? Simon considered this. Nirupam and a number of other people doubled their legs under their chairs, ready to spring up and gag Simon if necessary. Teresa once more jumped to her feet. Mr Wentworth, if he says another word, I'm not staying. Unfortunately, this attracted Simon's attention. You, he said to Teresa, stink. He seems to have spoken, said Mr Wentworth. Get out and stand in the corridor, Teresa, with a black mark for bad behaviour. Simon can have another, and the rest of us will have a lesson. Teresa, redder in the face than anyone had ever seen her, raced for the door. She could not, however, beat the truly awful smell which rolled off her and filled the room as she ran. Pooh! said Dan Smith. Somebody kicked him, and everybody looked nervously at Mr. Wentworth to see if he could smell it too. But, as often happens to people who smoke a pipe, Mr. Wentworth had less than the average sense of smell. It was not for five minutes, during which he had written numerous things on the board and said many more, none of which 6B were in a fit state to attend to, that he said, Estelle, put down that grey bag you're knitting and open a window, will you? There's rather a smell in here. Has someone let off a stink bomb? Nobody answered. Nirupam resourcefully passed Simon a note saying, Say there is no smell in here. Simon spelled it out. He considered it carefully with his head on one side. He could see there was a trick in it somewhere, so he cunningly decided to say nothing. Luckily, the open window, though it made the room almost as cold as Simon's ice age, did slowly disperse the smell. 
but nothing could disperse it from Teresa, who stood in the passage giving out scents of sludge, kippers and old dustbins until the end of afternoon school. When the bell had rung and Mr Wentworth swept from the room, everyone relaxed with a groan. No one had known what Simon was going to say next. Even Charles had found it a strain. He had to admit that the results of his spell had taken him thoroughly by surprise. Meanwhile, Delia and Karen, with most of Teresa's main friends, were determined to retrieve Teresa's honour. They surrounded Simon. Take that smell off her at once, Delia said. It's not funny. You've been on her all afternoon, Simon Silverson. Simon considered them. Nirupam leaped up so quickly that he knocked over his desk and tried to put his hand over Simon's mouth. But he got there too late. You girls, said Simon, all stink. The result was almost overpowering. So was the noise the girls made. The only girls who escaped were the lucky few like Nan, who had already left the room. It was clear something had to be done. Most people were either smelling or choking, and Simon was slowly opening his mouth to say something else. Nirupam left off trying to pick up his desk and seized hold of Simon by his shoulders. You can break this spell, he said to him. You could have stopped it straight away if you had any brain at all, but you would be greedy. Simon looked at Nirupam in slow, dawning annoyance. He was accused of being stupid. Him! He opened his mouth to speak. Don't say anything! Everyone near him shouted. Simon gazed around at them, wondering what trick they were up to now. Nirupam shook him. Say this after me, he said. And when Simon's dull, cunning eyes turned to him, Nirupam said slowly and loudly, Nothing I said this afternoon came true. Go on, say it. Say it! Everyone yelled. Simon's slow mind was not proof against all this yelling. It gave in. Nothing I said this afternoon came true, he said obediently. The smell instantly stopped. Presumably everything else was also undone, because Simon at once became his usual self again. He had almost no memory of the afternoon, but he could see Nirupam was taking unheard of liberties. He looked at Nirupam's hands, one on each of his shoulders, in surprise and annoyance. Get off, he said. Take your face away. The spell was still working. Nirupam was forced to let go and stand back from Simon. But as soon as he had, he plunged back again and once more took hold of Simon's shoulders. He stared into Simon's face like a great dark hypnotist. Now say, he said, nothing I say is going to come true in the future. Simon protested at this. He had great plans for the future. Now look here, he said. And of course, Nirupam did. He looked at Simon with such intensity that Simon blinked as he went on with his protest. But I'll fail every exam I ever take. His voice faded out into a sort of hoot as he realised what he had said. For Simon loved passing exams. He collected A's and 90% as fervently as he collected honour marks, and what he had just said had stopped all that. Exactly, said Nirupam. Now you've got to say it. Nothing I say... Oh, all right. Nothing I say is going to come true in the future, Simon said peevishly. Nirupam let go of him with a sigh of relief and went back to pick up his desk. Everyone sighed. Charles turned sadly away. Well, it had been good while it lasted. What's the matter? Nirupam asked, catching sight of Charles's doleful face as he stood his desk on its legs again. 
Nothing, Charles said. I've, I've got detention. Then, with a good deal more pleasure, he turned to Simon. So have you, he said. Simon was scandalised. What? I've never had detention all the time I've been at this school. It was explained to him that this was untrue. Quite a number of people were surprisingly ready to give Simon details of how he had rendered himself mindless and gained an hour and a half of detention from Mr Crossley. Simon took it in very bad part and stormed off, muttering. Charles was about to trudge away after Simon when Nirupam caught his arm. Sit on the back bench, he said. There's a store of comics in the middle on the shelf underneath. Thanks, said Charles. He was so unused to people being friendly that he said it with enormous surprise and almost forgot to take Mr Towers's awful book with him. He trudged towards the old lab where detention was held and shortly found himself trudging behind Teresa Mullet. Teresa was proceeding towards detention looking wronged and tragic, supported by a crowd of her friends, with Karen Grigg in addition. It's only for an hour, Charles heard Karen say consolingly. A whole hour, Teresa exclaimed. I shall never forgive Teddy Crossley for this. I hope Miss Hodge kicks him in the teeth. In order not to go behind Teresa's procession the whole way, Charles turned off halfway through the quadrangle and went by the way that was always called Around the Back. It was a grassy space which had once been a second quadrangle, but the new labs and the lecture room and the library had been built in the space, sticking out into the grass at odd angles, so that the space had been pared down to a zigzag of grassy passage, where for some reason there was always a piercing wind blowing. It was a place where people only went to keep out of the way. So Charles was not particularly surprised to see Nan Pilgrim loitering about there. He prepared to glare at her as he trudged by. But Nan got in first with a very unfriendly look and moved off around the library corner. I'm glad it wasn't Charles Morgan who wrote me that note, Nan thought, as Charles went on without speaking. I don't want any help from him. She loitered out into the keen wind again, wondering if she needed help from anyone. She still felt a strong, confident inner witchiness. It was marvellous. It was like laughter bubbling up through everything she thought. She could not believe that it might be only Simon's doing. On the other hand, no one knew better than Nan how quickly inner confidence could drain away, particularly if someone like Teresa laughed at you. Another person was coming, Brian Wentworth this time, but he scurried by on the other side of the passage to Nan's relief. She did not think Brian could help anyone. And this place seemed unusually popular this evening. Here was Nirupam Singh now, wandering up from the other direction, looking rather pleased with himself. I took the spell off Simon Silverson, he said to Nan. I got him to say nothing he said was true. Good, said Nan. She wandered away around the library corner again. Did this mean she was no longer a witch then? She poked with one foot at the leaves and crisp packets the wind had blown into the corner. She could test it by turning them into something, she supposed. But Nirupam had followed her around the corner. No, wait, he said. It was me that sent you that note. Nan found this extremely embarrassing. She pretended to be very interested in the dead leaves. I don't need help, she said gruffly. Nirupam smiled and leaned against the library wall as if he was sunning himself. Nirupam had rather a strong personality, Nan realised. Though the sun was thin and yellow and the wind was whirling crisp packets about, Nirupam gave out such a strong impression of basking that Nan almost felt warm. Everyone thinks you're a witch, he said. Well, I am, Nan insisted because she wanted to be sure of it herself. You shouldn't admit it, said Nirupam, but it makes no difference. The point is, 
It's only a matter of time before someone goes to Miss Cadwallader and accuses you. Are you sure? They all want me to do things, said Nan. Teresa doesn't, said Niropan. Besides, you can't please everybody. Someone will get annoyed before long. I know this because my brother tried to please all the servants, but one of them thought my brother was giving more to the other servants and told the police, and my brother was burned in the streets of Delhi. I'm sorry, I didn't know, said Nan. She looked across at Niropan. His profile was like a chubby hawk, she thought. It looked desperately sad. My mother was burned too for trying to save him, Niropam said. That was why my father came to this country. But things are just the same here. What I want to tell you is this. I have heard of a witch's underground rescue service in England. They help accused witches to escape if you can get to one of their branches before the inquisitors come. I don't know where they send you or whom to ask, but Estelle does. If you are accused, you must get Estelle to help. Estelle? Nan said. She thought of Estelle's soft brown eyes and soft wriggly curls, and of Estelle's irritating chatter, and of Estelle's even more irritating way of imitating Teresa. She could not see Estelle helping anyone. Estelle is rather nice said Niropan. I come around here and talk to her quite often. You mean Estelle talks to you, said Nan. Niropan grinned. She does talk a lot, he agreed. But she will help. She told me she likes you. She was sad you didn't like her. Nan gaped. Estelle? It was not possible. No one liked Nan. But now, she remembered, Estelle had refused to come and threatened to drown her in the bathroom. All right, she said, I'll ask her. Thanks. But are you sure I'll be accused? Niropam nodded. There is this, you see. There are at least two other witches in 6B. Two, said Nan. I mean, I know there's one more. It's obvious. But why two? I told you said Niropan. I've had experience of witches. Each one has their own style. It's like the way everyone's writing is different. And I tell you that it was not the same person who did the birds in music and the spell on Simon today. Those are two quite different outlooks on life. But both those people must know they have been very silly to do anything at all, and they will both be wanting to put the blame on you. It could well be one of them who accuses you. So you must be very careful. I will do my part and warn you if I hear of any trouble coming. Then you must ask Estelle to help you. Do you see now? Yes, and I'm awfully grateful, said Nan. Regretfully, she saw she did not dare try turning the dead leaves into anything. And in spite of her promise to the old broom, she had better not ride it again. She was quite frightened, yet she still felt the laughing confidence bubbling up inside, even though there might not be anything now to be confident about. Watch it, she told herself. You must be mad.